So, hello everybody. Uh, I want to thank you all for assisting to this uh, workshop. Uh, I know that the Sustainable Places Terrific program is very interesting, so I'm glad that you chose to come and visit us today. Uh, we have three hours ahead of us. It seems a lot of time, but uh, you will see that uh, we have nine incredible, incredibly interesting projects that we are going to listen to, and uh, time will go uh, by very quickly. Uh, the, the session will be split, no, the workshop will be split into sessions. Uh, I will explain later on uh, how these sessions will be. Uh, in the meantime, while the speakers present their projects, you can write questions. You all attend this, you can write questions on the chat, and uh, we will answer those questions in the time we have for discussion. At the end of every section, we have a, a time for discussion, and we will try to answer all of them, um, and if there are a lot of them, then we will answer you uh, by email. Uh, well, and I, I am going, uh, before, before I give you a little, uh, a small introduction, uh, we are going to propose you right now a poll for you to choose to which sector you belong. I mean, uh, we want you to, to, to know what type of attendees we have today in the session, because uh, this may help us to understand which kind of organization is interested in this type of solutions, technologies, or, or projects. And then uh, the speakers can also uh, propose or change the way they, they explain their, their projects, depending on, on how, uh, on, on which type of attendees we have today. So well, while you answer to this poll, uh, well, let me give you a very brief introduction. So the European Union, you know, is in the path of implementing the Green Deal, where Europe aims to change uh, from a high carbon economy to a low carbon economy. All this without reducing prosperity, and at the same time, improving people's quality of life, and how 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 we want to improve the quality of life that will be achieved by cleaner air and water uh, will be achieved by a better health and this is very uh, remarkable in the times we are living and all together with a thriving natural world uh, the green deal will only be achieved among others by applying sustainable targets and climate change objectives these targets and objectives cannot be met without addressing changes at building, district, and urban levels. Uh, these changes involve designing, building, and retrofitting the places we live and work in a more sustainable way. So we are here today uh, to share information, to discuss, to learn from research and innovation projects that have been developed under the, under the EU Horizon 2020 Framework Program. So more specifically, uh, this workshop is focused in the integration of renewable energies in district heating and cooling systems for a sustainable living. So uh, as I mentioned before, the, the workshop will be split into sessions. The first session will last about one hour and a half. And in that session, we will have five 15 minute presentation of five different projects. Projects are with district, reward hit, related, tempo, match up, and uh, that's all. And then we will have a 20 minute discussion to, to answer your questions. Then we will continue with the second section. The second section is related to sustainable urban generation model development, to demonstration of smart city technologies in energy, transport, and ICT. At the end of this session, we will also have uh, 15 minutes for discussion. And in this session, we will present uh, three projects, DreamPack, Remo Urban, and Replicate. So uh, I'm not going to, pre to 
to present now all the speakers because as I said, uh, we have a lot of time uh, ahead, but it won't be that much because you will see there is a lot of things to talk about. So they will present themselves whenever it's their, his or her, her turn. And before I give the floor to the first speaker, uh, Daniel Moraver, uh, project officer from the European Union, is going to give you uh, a welcome. So Daniel, the floor is yours. And then uh, Maria Victoria Cambronero from ACCIONA will continue uh, the session, the first session with her project with district. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you very much. Um, I see that uh, my screen still not. Uh, can, can I can I have the presenter view, please? Okay, then. Thank you very much. I see that. Uh, I hope you can all hear me well. Just a quick sound check. Is that right? Okay. Love thank you very much. Love so perfect. Uh, so good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Carolina, Madam Chairman, for this Madam Chairwoman for this uh, kind introduction. Um, uh, well, I'm, I'm here. I've been asked uh, to uh, give you a quick introduction on, on why the European Commission is supporting innovation actions in the area of uh, renewable energy and district heating and cooling. So when I was planning about this uh, brief introduction, I thought, okay, it's the early, it's very early in the morning. So instead of uh, sharing sharing uh, the usual uh, the usual slides with them, uh, I think I'm going to tell them the story. So th this is how it goes. Um, it all started some some time ago, like uh, like uh, any other story, with a, with a, with a character, with a, with the main character, with a protagonist or a hero facing a challenge. In our case, the European society, the European citizens, and their need for a change towards a more sustainable society. Of course, I mean, as in any other story, uh, there is also a guide or a sidekick, some sort of, uh, I don't know, Mr. Miyagi to Daniel San or, or Pumba and Timon to Simba, in case you have kids. So in our story, the European Commission was that guy and uh, was helping our main character, our hero, so the EU society, first with a plan uh, at policy level with the heating and cooling strategy and the clean energy for all Europeans package, uh, which are high level, uh, high level policy packages uh, that are set in some guidelines and high level guidelines and uh, very ambitious targets and of course at this, as it was mentioned in the beginning by Carol, by Carolina they will be uh, soon updated with even more ambitious targets that from the policy perspective but also from the technological uh, point of view with the strategic energy technology plan at the more operational level with the uh, details of the uh, setting the details and the advances of the technologies that will form the backbone of our of our energy system in the future. So once this plan was in place, uh, the European Commission called for action with the different funding instruments, Horizon 2020, but also the new ones that will come now uh, and through the Green Deal instrument, Innovation Fund, and Horizon Europe a little bit later uh, in 2021. Uh, long story short, at the end, everything unraveled. And that, my dear colleagues, is the story of how you and I ended up here working on innovation with uh, these uh, very nice projects that we will have here today uh, presenting and many others that have been funded in the area and in many other areas. And this is why events like this one are uh, of paramount importance and extremely interesting uh, because they they allow these projects to uh, interact between themselves and in front of an audience and also set the basis for potential collaboration in the future. First, from the technological point of view, uh, these all projects are, are, are working on innovations on similar technologies that are all of them tested and will be tested at an urban environment. Uh, so, for example, low temperature energy networks, uh, smart control systems, uh, heat pumps, many different uh, technologies. And of course, it is very interesting for these projects to interact and, and learn from uh, each other's mistakes, of course. Um, that was from the technological point of view, but also uh, from the business side, uh, it is good that they interact so they can, uh, all the projects can bring innovations on the business models, making them more attractive to potential investors. 
And finally, of course, in terms of the wider dissemination to different stakeholder groups, uh, the EU citizens need to know that their money is being spent, is being well spent. So it's a very good opportunity that they get together, interact, and disseminate their their results. But also to different groups such as like uh, I don't know venture capital guys, for example, that could invest in these innovations, to local, regional, national authorities, up to the public at large. In summary, I'm looking forward to uh, see what they have to show us. I'm very excited about this and it is an honor for me to be here with all of you. And uh, well, thank you very much uh, for your presence and I hope you enjoy. Thank you very much, Daniel. Uh, it's, 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 uh, how would I say, how, I say, how you uh, push forward to to deal with with all the the, the challenges we have uh, in front of us so thank you very much daniel so now uh we are going to start with the first project which is the we district project uh our colleague uh mavi maria victoria cambronero from acciona will uh give us a presentation about this uh well uh integration of well she will she will tell us i i won't tell you anything so uh, maybe you have about 10 15 minutes uh if you finish uh, well tell me when you finish and then we will give the floor to the next speaker thank you maybe okay thank you uh can you hear me well and can you see my screen uh, yes, Mavi, we can hear you well and we can see you, but uh, please put your presentation on full view. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, uh, I'm showing my presentation. Can you see it? Yes, now it's perfect. Okay, okay. So thank you very much. Thank you, Caroline. Also, thank you, Daniel, for being here. And uh, welcome to all the attendees and also thank you for your time. As well, Carolina Presenting, uh, I'm Maria Victoria Cambronero. I belong to the engineering department of ACCIONA and uh, more in particular to the consultancy and innovation uh, uh, area. And I'm going to present uh, with this project, uh, which is quite aligned with, uh, well, with the objectives of the, or the directive to the, from the European Commission and what uh, Daniel uh, said before, uh, we are trying to be involved in this uh, new uh, generation. So well, uh, the picture is clear. Uh, within the, the European, European Union, uh, we are uh, consuming a lot of uh, energy from fossil fuels, in particular for heating and cooling, uh, which uh, accounts for 50% of the total energy consumption, uh, is generated from uh, fossil fuels by 70%. Uh, from our project, we are trying to well, to change uh, this uh, this uh, picture, and uh, our objective is to uh, to demonstrate that it's possible to generate different solutions, renewable solutions, 100% fossil free, uh, for being applicable to the district heating and cooling uh, um, options. Um, well, within the project, different uh, set of technologies and solutions are under development. We are we are working uh, from just one year ago. And uh, since I don't have enough time for explaining uh, in very deep detail um, all the technologies, I'm going to give a very brief overview of the different technologies develop, uh, which are uh, developing in the project. Uh, first, uh, we are developing three uh, different um, solar technologies, um, which here uh, is more uh, based on solar concentration technologies. Um, the parabolic graph collector and the Fresnel panel are in more mature um, moments in the market, I mean, uh, but within the project, uh, all the technologies, uh, well, we are trying to upgrade all the technologies if uh, they are already in the market in order to try or to improve the energy performance or and or reduce costs or, well, in, in, try to enhance them somehow. So in this case, uh, for the parabolic trap collector and for the business panel, panel um, we are reducing costs for using new materials, and uh, we are also uh, optimizing or improving the tracking and control uh, system by uh, well, using uh, wireless, uh, then we buy the, the, the wires and the cables. And uh, also we are introducing a small PV panel for the electricity consumption, so somehow we are uh, just improving this mature technology. Uh, 
Uh, on the other side, we are also um, developing a new a concentrator. Um, this is not on the market yet, uh, but uh, our idea is to well to develop within the project and to demonstrate that uh, we are uh, reducing the costs and improving the energy efficiency compared to other solar thermal conventional system. And in this case, we are using a solar thermal panels and we are adding some mirrors that can be oriented in order to optimize as much as possible the solar radiation. Uh, another technology is a biomass boiler. Uh, well, we all know that the biomass always renewable, but uh, there are some emissions, some air pollutants that are not good. And the challenge for this biomass boiler is to reduce the NOx emissions. It's the most uh, challenging in, in, in this moment. So it's what we are doing within the project. Uh, on the one hand, we are uh, reducing the, the emissions by improving uh, the internal design of the biomass uh, of the boiler, uh, improving the or optimizing the furnace geometry and uh, all other, other improvements. And on the other side, uh, for the high temperature low emissions biomass boiler, we are um, integrating a new uh, system of air filter system. Uh, I don't know here. Uh, if you can see, because I don't know if you see my screen well, uh, but uh, here, can you see my pointer? Well, uh, if not, uh, here. Yes, I can see yes, your pointer. Okay. okay, thank you. So here uh, is our high temperature emissions boiler. So here we have the Vimas boiler, and here you can see that we have added a new step of our filters. We are using a um, new uh, catalytic uh, and uh, non-catalytic uh, reduction techniques for reducing these uh, NOx emissions, which is really important for this biomass boiler. On the other side, we have also developed, and this is something that has been already finalized, um, another concept of a biomass boiler, which is um, integrated as a full package. So here you can see uh, in, in 3D model, the view, but it's exactly how it has been uh, finalized. So this is a, a very good option for, uh, you can see this option as a plug and play system, biomass boiler system. Well, we have, uh, we are also developing two new technologies, uh, cooling system technologies. Uh, this first one is a renewable air cooling unit. This is intended for HVAC applications, so we are producing uh, cool air uh, by only using air and water. So we are not using refrigerant. You can imagine that we are reducing uh, uh, up to 80% the CO2 emissions. And on the other side, we don't use compressors, so the electricity consumption is really, really low. So here, uh, well, this is a very well uh, can be very well connected to this TTP because it can be fed by low temperature, so it's a very good option for the for the HVAC application and cooling purposes. The second cooling system is uh, based on an uh, sourcing chiller in this for generating cool water. So in this case, what we are doing is to um, well integrate a new internal step uh, where uh, we uh, recover heat. Uh, for the internal operations. So using this uh, heat recovery, we are able to improve the COP, the COP, the coefficient of performance of the uh, by, uh, absor uh, absorption chiller um, by almost 1.2, 1.3 for a simple effect. So considering that the uh, conventional absorption chiller, the COP is around 0 0.7 or 0 0.8, it's a quite good improvement. This is another uh, different solution. Uh, it's a hybridization of a uh, solar photovoltaic and geothermal system. So we, it is a hybrid uh, thermal and electrical uh, system. So here, what we want to demonstrate is the, the integration of the different uh, components and from thermal and electrical components can uh, operate in an optimal way. And uh, thanks to this uh, solution, we can generate heat, coal, and electricity. So in the end, this is a three generation system that can be applied also to the street heating as uh, we are going to do in one of our demo sites. So here what we are uh, integrating is uh, on the one hand, uh, we have a, a boil hole, uh, well, a geothermal system with a boil hole and also a heat pump. Uh, of course, the hot water storage. Uh, we are also introducing a solar thermal palace. In fact, it's a thermal uh, PVT panels, a hybrid panels for domestic hot water. So we are covering heat and domestic hot water as well. 
And on the other side, uh, we are installing the photovoltaic system for feeding the heat pump um, electricity consumption. That is also, uh, well, it's our hybridization, so we can able to, we are able to produce this uh, uh, amount of energy by with uh, this uh, hybrid system. Um, another solution, of course, when we are talking about renewable energies, we need to to talk about the storage. Uh, the conventional system, water storage, this is also that we are also using the project, but uh, we are developing a new concept for district heating solutions, uh, which uh, deals with the uh, uh, molten salts uh, storage. So, um, well, these uh, salts are already used for a very big uh, thermal, uh, thermal solar uh, installations. Uh, here, the challenge is to use this uh, molten salt storage in, uh, with a smaller size. And using salts, molten salts, um, with the temperature level suitable uh, to the, to the, what the, the temperature level requires uh, in a district heating. So we are talking about uh, to store energy in around uh, 200 uh, degrees. This is the temperature that comes from the solar concentrated panels. And uh, thanks to the, to the massive storage density, it's possible to store such amount of energy in a smaller size. As uh, so you can see here, uh, compared to a water storage, uh, we can reduce by up to 20 times the, the size, and this reduces the cost for the for the storage. And since we are working with a high level temperature, this storage can be used as well as a, as a backup boiler. Um, a completely different solution. This is a waste heat recovery system. Um, well, it, this is a completely new uh, option. Um, what we are going to do within the project is to, well, here we have a data center. We know that the data center generates a lot of uh, heat and the data center doesn't want uh, that heat and uh, we want that heat. So we are going to recover that uh, waste heat. However, uh, this uh, waste heat is not at suitable temperature for being injected directly to the, to the district heating. Then we need a new, uh, well, and a step in between, and uh, this step uh, will be done uh, by introducing and integrating a fuel cell, a fuel cell that can be fed by biogas or hydrogen. Uh, it's uh, in the end a cogeneration system, and it's possible to generate electricity and heat. So the electricity can be um, uh, used for feeding the the own data center, and the heat. Uh, will have uh, the suitable temperature for being injected in the district heating, and uh, it's great for us because it's what we want to do to uh, recover this uh, waste heat and be injected to the district heating. And of course, uh, everything should work in an optimal way, so we need a brain. Our brain is uh, the, an advanced uh, digitalization system. Uh, this uh, uh, digitization system will be uh, based on uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence, uh, the weather and demand forecast, etc. So, um, is uh, as I said, is our brain. So we need to say to our system how to operate optimally because we can have uh, very good technologies, but uh, we need to 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 make them work together and the most optimal way. So we need this. Uh, this is this is key for the for the better operation. And very quickly, because I know that I don't have a lot of time, uh, all these technologies will be implemented in a real scale project. Uh, within the project, we have four different uh, demo sites, one in Madrid, where we are going to install a new district heating and cooling system, and most of the technologies will be deployed then. Uh, a retrofit system, a current district heating that is not covering at the end of the branch uh, the, all the energy requirements. So we are going to complement in Bucharest the current district heating with the hybridation, the hybrid system. In Poland, uh, the, this uh, current district heating, which is fed by coal. So we're going to remove that coal and then to show the potential to remove that coal and, uh, and introduce the uh, biomass renewable system. And finally, in Lulea, in Sweden, uh, we're going to demonstrate this uh, new heat recovery system for being injected in the uh, Lulea district heating. Besides this uh, real demonstration site, uh, we are going to also uh, study all the virtual demonstration uh, using simulation. And uh, for that purpose, a uh, different demo followers has joined, a lot of uh, demo followers has joined to this project. 
Um, and we are going to demonstrate this uh, with this replicability and to study in the different with different boundary conditions and the different countries how these uh, Buddhistic solutions uh, can be applied in, in those sites. Uh, this is uh, my conclusion. Just the three main uh, results from our study. First, we want to show that uh, 100 uh, renewable district heating and cooling system is possible. After the project, we will show a set of different uh, solutions for replication uh, that can be used for district heating and cooling networks. And uh, last but not least, uh, to be in touch with the end users, because we think that this is a key, uh, to uh, well, in, uh, engage the, the public uh, acceptance, because uh, well, in some places, the district heat and cooling systems are not, are not developed at all. And just uh, to, if you want to know more about the project, we are in the social media. Uh, I engage you also to subscribe to our community of interest. Um, this is a very big consortium. Just uh, one word to say to all the consortium, thank you, because uh, during these COVID times, they are working a lot and, uh, well, we are working a lot and making an extra effort for uh, meeting all the deadlines and following the, the plan. And I wanted to to, well, to give a special thanks to, to all the consortium. You can see their faces. And uh, yes, we are at your disposal for uh, providing you more information, because I know that I'm being <laughs> very quick, but uh, I don't know. Uh, and in fact, I think that I have used more time than uh, it was uh, planned. So sorry, Carolina. Yes, I have finalized. Thank you, Mavi. Uh, thank you very much. It's OK. I know that, that you could speak for hours about this uh, amazing project. But well, we don't have time. In fact, uh, we have a question, but we are going to leave it for the discussion uh, part of this section. OK, so because we have we want to to give the floor now to Jack Korskaden uh, from Euroheat and Power, who is going uh, to talk about uh, the, uh, the the project reward hit. So Jack, present yourself and I give you the floor. Thanks very much, Carolina. Uh, can you see my screen in presenter mode? Yes, yes, Jack, yes, it works yes. perfectly. Um, sorry, one second, now I can't see the presentation. Okay, here we go. Um, yeah, so thanks again, Carolina. Uh, so my name is Jack Korsgaden and I work for the DHC Plus technology platform uh, within Euroheat and Power, which is the European Association for District Heating and Cooling. I'm here today on behalf of the Reward Heat project. Um, Reward Heat stands for Renewable and Waste Heat Recovery for Competitive District Heating and Cooling Networks. Um, and yeah, I'm briefly going to explain the aims of the project, uh, some of our objectives, and then I'll introduce some of our innovative demo sites. Uh, so just as a brief project overview, um, the project consists of 28 partners from 10 different countries um, with a total budget of 19 million euro. And the project will run for four years and we are about one year into the project and it will run until September 2023. Uh, the project is an innovation action funded under Horizon 2020 and it is coordinated by Eurac uh, Research, who are based in Italy. Um, so just as a bit of a background to the project, uh, on a global scale, uh, heating and cooling account for over half of total final energy consumption, uh, most of which is derived from greenhouse gas emitting fossil fuels. Um, at the moment, just over 10% of the thermal energy consumed across the globe comes from renewable energy sources and at the same time 72 percent of the european population live in towns and cities um, while the demand for heating and cooling is highest in these areas there is also um, a large amount of um, heat available within urban environments so low-grade uh, waste heat is diffused into the air by air conditioners, cooling systems in industrial processes and tertiary buildings, uh, chillers of refrigeration systems and service facilities such as um, sewage water. And for historical reasons, towns and cities are often uh, located close to bodies of water. Uh, these bodies of water provide a freely available source of cooling. 
Um, so when combined, uh, these low temperature renewable energy sources are rel readily available um, and their utilization is highly replicable because they are located right where they are needed uh, within city contexts. Um, and that's not even to mention the solar um, the solar energy potential, both for thermal and electrical purposes. Uh, so the vision of Reward Heat is to demonstrate district heating and cooling networks which are able to recover renewable and waste heat which is available at low temperature, i.e. lower than 40 degrees Celsius. To do this we need to lower the supply temperature compared to conventional uh, third generation networks. So low supply temperature um, normally operates at less than 60 degrees and we will also deploy ultra low supply temperature networks um, which operate between 10 and 20 degrees Celsius. Um, so capturing and integrating renewable energy sources into these low temperature networks has a variety of benefits. Um, it reduces uh, fossil fuel consumption, increases energy security, increases efficiency and lowers overall primary energy demand. Um, so the focus is on the exploitation uh, within the urban context as this will maximize the upscaling potential of the decentralized solutions. Um, so in a nutshell, it's about smart networks integrating renewable and waste energy sources. Um, so the first objective is to integrate multiple uh, urban renewable Sorry, the first objective is to integrate multiple urban renewable and waste energy sources. Um, so the project will explore ex alternative configurations uh, of a district heating and cooling network where multiple heating and cooling sources are available. Um, and the aim of this is to provide recommendations uh, for the replication of the systems uh, depending on their different boundary conditions. So the cost effective solutions to be deployed during the project will be able to satisfy 80% of the system energy requirements with renewable and waste heat energy. So the next objective is to develop innovative technologies for the flexible use of heat in district heating and cooling networks. On the substation level, uh, this involves prefabrication for building solutions and standardization for large scale district heating plants. Uh, so small scale prefab prefabricated substations up to, up to 50 kilowatts, um, including booster heat pumps will be deployed and these will be specialized to the specific demonstration cases. And a large scale industrial ener industrialized energy center will be deployed at the sub network level, which basically functions as a large scale standardized um, thermal plant and prefabrication and standardization result in lower costs. Um, single pipes adapted to low temperature um, low temperature operation will also be deployed um, resulting in fewer heat losses and the longer shelf life of the pipes. Um, in terms of thermal storage, um, a variety of storage solutions will be deployed across different temporal and spatial scales. Uh, so local intraday storages will be deployed at customer substations. Central intraday storages will be used to balance the network and store energy during off-peak periods. And this will be deployed at in the mine water network located in Herlen in the Netherlands. And the kind of the concept behind the storage solution is shown in the, the graphic at the bottom of the screen. And also central centralized seasonal storage in the form of borehole storage will be used. The next objective is to demonstrate digitalization solutions um, that will allow for the optimization of the management of the network. So storage capacity and control will be used to synergically uh, manage the system. Smart metering will be used to communicate real-time data. Um, and a data mining platform will allow communication with the smart meters and enable smart control. Um, fault detection will be deployed and expert control strategies will be elaborated uh, for the optimization of district heating and cooling networks and coupling with the electricity grid. The next objective is to develop business models and financial schemes to enable large public and private investments to be mobilized. Um, so the overall idea is to encourage a paradigm shift with regard to the thinking behind business models um, with the aim of viewing of, of selling heat as a service rather than as a commodity. 
and as well as that financial support approaches will be elaborated based on reliable and transparent information uh, allowing for a clear risk assessment. And here are some of our demo cases. So um, the, <clears throat> the demo sites um, consist of a variety of either newly built or retrofitted district heating and cooling networks operating at either low or neutral temperature. So new networks will be deployed in Milan, Hamburg and Helsingborg and Molendal, which I will talk about um, in a few minutes. Uh, a retrofitted network to, to low temperature will be deployed at Albertsund in Denmark. The Tupusco demo strike consists of heat cascading in a low temperature network. Um, and both the Toulon and Herland demo cases are neutral temperature networks that will be upscaled during the project. In terms of the technologies to be deployed, so waste heat exploitation will be deployed at all of the demo sites but one, um, and we will harvest waste, waste heat from supermarkets um, from a, an existing high temperature network, an electric transformer, as well as industrial waste heat. Um, Heat pumps will also be deployed at all of the networks but one. Um, the majority of these heat pumps are located at substation level um, to boost uh, water temperature for consumption in neutral temperature networks, while this, uh, the uh, Swedish demo site will deploy a centralized heat pump. Um, district cooling is also implemented at three networks, uh, as well as geothermal energy and solar thermal. Uh, sorry, solar and bioenergy will be um, <clears throat> will be capitalised on in the French and Swedish demo cases, whereas the Swedo ca Swedish case will use um, a solar thermal field, whereas the French is um, solar PV, uh, and we will also deploy a variety of thermal energy storage solutions. So the first demo site I'll talk about is Tupusco, which is located in Croatia. Um, so the demo site consists of heat cascading in an existing low temperature network. Um, the network serves both residential and tertiary buildings, including two hotels with spa and swimming pool facilities. Uh, so the network exploits high temperature geothermal energy from four wells, um, which is available year round at 64 degrees Celsius. Um, at, at the moment, the hot water is cooled down to around 30 degrees by means of wet cooling towers um, before being released into the sewage system. And the project aims to increase the efficiency by using this hot water to drive absorption chillers so that district cooling can be provided during the summer. And this increases the overall efficiency of the system uh, as well as reducing the environmental impact at the demo site by reducing the amount of hot water that is expelled into the environment. And the next demo site is Helsingborg and Molendal, located in Sweden. Um, so this is this demo site consists of two different uh, newly built low temperature networks. Um, the Helsingborg network consists of a low temperature sub network that exploits uh, borehole seasonal thermal energy storage uh, combined with a centralized heat pump. And this borehole storage is charged by industrial surplus heat as well as a solar thermal um, field and it is refilled during the summer um, when the heat demand is low and then the, the storage is emptied during the winter to meet the, um, the increased heat demand. Um, and the Molendal network also deploys um, uh, borehole storage um, but is also connected to um, a more large scale district heating network which is supplied by 100% biofuel um, and the network consists of a four pipe distribution system that supplies space heating at 40 degrees and domestic hot water at 60 degrees Celsius. Um, and lastly we have the French demo site um, which exploits um, cool, free cooling available from nearby seawater. Um, so the network has been operational since 2008 and will be extended during the years of the project. And the main neutral temperature network is used for both district heating and district cooling and operates at a temperature between 7 to 29 degrees Celsius. Uh, the temperature varies throughout the year depending on the seawater temperature um, and the balance between the heating and cooling uh, thermal loads. And the district heating and cooling network exploits renewable energy from seawater that is constantly available 
Um, however, the temperature of the seawater obviously changes uh, throughout the seasons. And some stations, some of the substations uh, hooked up to the network, uh, natural gas is used to uh, increase the water temperature for domestic hot water and um, with a view to changing to biogas in the coming years. And the number of customers um, served by the, the network was four at the beginning of the project, which will increase to 20 by the end of the project. And the focus is on the implementation of smart metering um, and control hardware and software to optimize the, um, the energy consumption in the network. Um, so yeah, that's all from me for now. Um, thanks a lot for listening. I'll, I'll hand it back to Carolina. Thank you very much, Jack. Uh, again, another super interesting project. And I always find out that your demo, demo projects, all of them are a project itself. And I, I, have, I have so many questions, but well, uh, we run out of time. Uh, so we have another question for you, but we will let it for the discussion part of this session, if you don't mind. So let's move now to uh, Antonio. Let me. Um, ah, sorry. Sorry about that. Antonio uh, Antonio Garrido from Tecnalia is going to talk for 10, 15 minutes about the related project. And well, not to lose more time, uh, Antonio, I give you the floor. So I think you can see now my screen, right? Yes, yes we can see. Okay, so uh, thank you very much uh, for all the people that are attending today this, ses uh, this session and uh, to my colleagues. They were really interesting presentations. And since I'm the third, I will say some concepts that they have already talked about, but well, this is how it goes. So uh, I work for Technalia, which belongs to the Bash Research and Technology Alliance. And I'm going to present uh, this project, which uh, works on new concepts on ultra low temperature district heating networks. Uh, which is the, the background for this uh, project is that the fuel based heat production uh, technologies, the conventional technologies that uh, are uh, most widespread today, uh, gas boiler or combined heating and power, and others are uh, really working at high performance levels. So the improvements in the efficiency levels of these uh, technologies have minimal impact on the path to decarbonize district heatings. Uh, this doesn't mean that you can uh, optimize the behavior with uh, different parameters, such as the working temperature. But uh, what I mean is that the technolo technology is working today at high efficiency levels. Uh, so if you want to decarbonize the heat sources, you have to go to renewable and waste heat sources, as my colleagues have already said. These sources work with competitive energy cost, and uh, they don't fluctuate with the price of gas and oil, which is uh, really good. Of course, they are local and they are clean. So uh, I see many advantages of these on these technologies. All of these can be enhanced if you reduce the operation temperature of the district heating, increasing uh, the integration and performance of these kind of systems. Today, uh, the decarbonation of district heatings rely on three pillars, uh, production side, consumption side, and distribution side. Uh, all of these, uh, these three pillars can be, uh, um, can, be incre can increase the, the efficiency if you reduce the supply temperature of the network towards what's so-called the fourth generation district heatings with ultra low temperature. I have uh, different, maybe different um, range of temperatures, uh, what we call ultra low temperatures. Uh, my colleagues, Jack said uh, 10, 20, we'll say uh, 30, 45, but well, this is kind of definitions. But if you reduce the supply temperature of your district heating network, uh, there are uh, uh, more waste heat sources that you can uh, include in the network. Maybe the, today they are, uh, the, the waste heat is at 50 degrees and cannot be integrated in most DC heating, but with this fourth generation, you will be able to increase to use them. Uh, the efficiency of renewable energy sources also is increased with the reduction of temperature. Uh, with uh, 
uh, these three heatings that work at ultra low temperature, you can supply energy at nearly zero and positive energy buildings without a problem because they don't work with these old radiators that need around 80 degrees. And of course, as Jack also said, you uh, reduce the energy losses on your distribution side. Uh, with these low temperatures, you can work with the buildings as prosumers, working as energetic nodes with uh, bidirectional substations. When they have surplus of energy production, you will use the district heating as, as thermal storage. And when you have uh, a deficit of production, you will use the district heating as backup. Uh, for for um, boosting the temperature for the domestic uh, hot water uh, thermal levels, we will integrate the heat pumps uh, to to comply with the health uh, requirements. As I said, the reduction of the temperature of operation will increase the efficiency of your renewable energies. And the figure that I include here uh, on the y-axis, you can see the collector thermal efficiency. Uh, on the x-axis, you can see the gradient of, of temperatures between the ambient and the mean temperature uh, through the collectors. Uh, as you reduce this gradient, you can see the increase in efficiency. This is uh, especially true for unglazed flat uh, plate collectors. Cooling is, has also been mentioned today. Cooling uh, plays an important role in future sustainable energy systems. Uh, with climate change, the summer, we know this quite well in Spain, are uh, warmer, but also with passive house standards, they, they are uh, in north countries, uh, northern countries like Norway, they are experiencing uh, uh, problems with heating inside during the, the during summer. So cooling is really a very important uh, key play on, on future sustainable energy sources. Cooling is included in fourth generation district heatings, and to include this on the on on, on the on the district heating, uh, we are proposing to use reversible heat pump systems using the network as condensation sink. So as I already said, we need these heat pumps for the domestic hot water. So if we make them uh, reversible, we can uh, use them for cooling. On the path on, or in the line that the, the different European directives are, are uh, saying that we need to do, because they are always in favor of the residential energy consumption for heating pumps to electrify the demand. Uh, of course, the electricity have higher prices, but the heat pumps have really good performance, especially at low temperatures. We need to be careful with the electrification uh, because some mixes are high on fossil fuels. With all this background, uh, uh, we have uh, the main concept, the development related are, of course, the reduction of DC heat and operative temperature uh, in the on the path to ultra low temperature. Uh, we are working on developing new building integrated solar thermal systems. On um, the three types of collectors, uh, the unglaze type, as we has we have seen, uh, uh, develop inside related have really really good performance working at this uh, low temperature. For the combination of uh, solar thermal systems and district heating, uh, we are using these uh, um, substations that you can see on the right. Uh, they are uh, three function scheme substations and. As I said, when the uh, solar systems are producing uh, excess heat, we uh, inject this into the network. When uh, the buildings need more uh, energy that the solar system can provide, we use the, the network as backup. Uh, and also, we are developing uh, within related uh, new reversible heat pump systems, uh, especially uh, devoted to this kind of temperatures that we're talking about. The concept of related or how we see the, the networks in the future will look like this, more or less. Uh, a big uh, network, a big ring that can uh, get heat from, from uh, industrial waste heat or from cooling plants or different uh, also data centers, as um, my colleague said. Also, large solar systems that are maybe away from the city but also close enough to include the, the production into the network but at the same time using the different uh, buildings positive energy buildings as uh, uh, energetic nodes where we are injecting and we are getting uh, energy in a directional mode uh, also you can see here uh, different buildings with uh, uh, solar thermal collectors integrated in the building. 
the conclusions that we are so related has been working for two years and half one and a half uh, year more and we already have some conclusions the so we are on the path of four generation district heatings and the decarbonization of, of the of the of the cities of the districts ultra low temperature district heating is a clear opportunity to operate the network as a decentralized system sorry if i'm uh, saying again concepts that have already said but some term uh, so with this with this uh, network, we will be able to dis uh, to dis to work with distributed sources such as solar thermal and waste heat, um, and we will be able to integrate the solar thermal with the district heating as both thermal storage and backup. The substations that we're developing inside uh, related have really good uh, performance when working in combination with uh, solar thermals. The efficiency levels go from 44 to 62, as we have already tested. And the, the uh, district heating reversible heat pumps are used for also as for cooling services for domestic hot water and also for the recuperation of low energy energy heat sources uh, such as industrial processes. Uh, so boosting the the low temperature waste heat that can be around, as Maria Victoria said. Still, we have one uh, year and a half to go, maybe two years, uh, because uh, maybe we. Uh, as for an extension and in the future work we will demonstrate these concepts in four demo sites uh, around europe uh, in serbia in denmark in um, spain and in uh, estonia and yes we are expected to be finished in 2021 but maybe we will go for uh, an extension and this has been all and thank you very much for listening uh, thank you antonio again another example of uh of how to improve energy efficiency how to decor decarbonize district and heating sector uh, since we have time with you i will take the opportunity to make you a question so uh, regarding the electrification of the demand what happens in those countries where the electricity mix is highly dependent on fossil fuels antonio what happens mm -hmm. in those countries so this is a very, this is a very good question that we are uh, trying to understand the 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 implication on the use of heating uh, pumps uh, so you can say we are decarbonizing the 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 network but i would prefer to say we are uh, elect we are on the path to electrify the the network so in those countries like poland they have really high presence of fossil fuels on the on the um, on the network sometimes it's uh, a bad uh, choice to change from gas boilers to heat pumps as we have seen it depends on the uh, external temperature or, or in the temperature of the network but uh, you have to be very careful with with this as the uh, the pressure of fossil fuels on the on the on the electricity mix can go against your interest i hope the answer is to your yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, Antonio. So, well, let's move uh, to the next project. Um, it's Tempo project where uh, Dirk Van Holt, I don't know if I pronounce it well. Uh, you see, we have people from all around uh, Europe. We'll talk about, from Vito, uh, will give us a brief explanation about this also interesting project. Uh, Dirk, the, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you. So I hope you can hear me and that you see my slides. Yeah, um, okay. All right, thanks a lot. Um, I'm going to give you a, a short introduction about the Tempo project. I'm Dirk van Hout and I work for uh, Energyville and Vito, that is a, well, a Flemish uh, research organization um, located in Belgium. The Temple project, uh, this workshop is uh, about integration of renewables and district heating. The Temple project has to do with uh, lowering the, uh, the temperatures in the network. And why is that important? That's important because many of those sustainable sources, um, they only offer a limited temperature. Huh? Um, so 
the lower you can bring your your temperatures in your network the higher the share uh, of energy that those sustainable sources can de deliver to this to this network so that that's why it's important in in future and also in current networks that we lower these uh, temperatures um <clears throat> you have an overview of the project partners it's a rather small project maybe in comparison to the others that they are presented here we have a good mix of research institutes of uh, industry uh, network operators and so on um, the main focus in tempo is on technology huh, and technological innovations and actually there are six that we develop and we want to demonstrate here one is uh, what we call a supervision platform for detection and diagnosis of faults mainly in district heating substations then we want to uh, develop visualization tools, both for experts and for non-expert users, uh, the consumers or the tenants of the, the different houses. We also work on a smart controller of the, of the network, not only to balance supply and demand and to, to cut uh, peaks, for example, in the, in the network, but also to minimize the return temperature, uh, the temperature that goes back to your source. Uh, there's an innovate an innovative piping concept being developed uh, that uses three pipes instead of two uh, and this is mainly to uh, minimize the bypass flow rate which is always present in uh, in substations for comfort reasons then we work on the building installation itself huh? so the heating supply circuit and the domestic hot water circuit in buildings because we see that a lot of things can go wrong there which lead to high return temperatures and obviously when the return temperature in such a, a secondary system is high then this will be transferred to the heat network as well and then we also work on decentralized buffers uh, so storage tanks in uh, every building connected to the network we have two demonstration sites. Uh, one is a new uh, network in rural Germany. Uh, characteristic for that network is that in, in this situation, the heat uh, density is very low. And normally district heating would not be economically feasible here eh, because you need a lot of piping for only a limited heat demand. So um, the, 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 the main um, innovation here is that they're gonna install uh decentralized buffers in every of those single houses and by installing these these buffers uh the peak demand uh is is reduced huh? and in that way also the dimensions of the pipe can the pipes can be reduced and in that way uh the the investment costs go down as well on top of these decentralized buffers obviously there's a lot of other um uh, technologies that will be tested here as well. The second demonstration site is an existing network eh? because a lot of those, uh, uh, well, a lot of networks are already present and we want to see if it's possible to reduce the network temperatures also in these existing ones. Eh? Um, so therefore we also involved the network of A2A in Brescia in Italy and we isolated one of the network branches and we wanted to test if it's possible to reduce the temperature there. Uh, some words about the status. Um, in the German network, uh, the, what we call the, the inner pipe demonstrator, we saw uh, what we see is that the, the, the number of connections steadily increase. Uh, this is a, a new developed area where the buildings are being constructed uh, as we speak. And every now and then uh, a building got finalized and is then connected to the network. Uh, so the number of connections is obviously still rising. Uh, but in every of those buildings, we already have the, those decentralized buffers installed. Um, here you see the results of the last winter period, which was the first winter in which we could do uh, tests. And that will be the remainder of this presentation. I will give an insight in the results of those first uh, uh, testing uh, period. So what you see here on the left is this is the, the, the power uh, that's being uh, transported in the network. You have the blue line, which is the, 
the power produced, right, the heat produced, and you have the orange, which is the, the consumption. And obviously, the, the difference between both are heat losses. So, and that's also shown in the on the right. Huh? Um, the distribution losses can be quite high, especially in summer period where it can go up to 60%. And this is because of the fact that this is a rural network huh? um, with, a, with a low heat demand. So, um, this is quite significant, actually. Even in uh, in winter periods, we have distribution losses around 20%. Um, obviously, it's hard to say if this is good or bad huh, because there's no physical reference where we can com compare to. Huh? This is uh, a new network, so we have nothing to compare to. So that, that's why we build also a simulation environment in which uh, we simulated th this network uh, topology and uh, configuration, and we compared it to um, a reference case, which is just a regular heat network which are, with a regular standard stop station and a hot water storage in uh, the houses. And then we also have measurements from the first uh, winter season. So what you see is actually both the power and the uh, energy consumed is lower in the concept which was proposed by uh, uh, as in, in the temple project and what you also see is that the measured uh, the measured power or distribution losses is uh, is even lower than what was simulated uh, um, we see that we have about seven percent less distribution losses compared to the reference and well, that was not shown in the table, but there's a 5% saving in investment costs because of those smaller network pipes. Um, as I said, um, the monitored losses are significantly lower than the simulated ones, but we have to be careful here because this might also have to, or, or most probably has to do with the fact that the network is not fully operational yet in reality, so parts of the network don't have flow yet yet so you don't have losses there as well so this this number will uh will, will decrease obviously yeah and uh and it will co become closer uh to what has been simulated uh nevertheless uh, distribution losses are still rather high as said and this um, underlines again the necessity of lower temperature networks in this kind of rural uh situations then the second network, yeah, the Italian network, uh, operated by A2A. There we, as said, we isolated one of the network branches, and this is one that is connected to one family house, consisted of 43 uh, flats. And on top of that, it also has 34 single family houses. And what was done there is that they installed what is called a mixing station um, between the main network and this uh, sub network and this mixing station is mixing fresh supply uh, water from the main network with return water from uh, uh, from the demo site and um, in that way it's possible to reduce the supply temperature going to this uh, to this uh, yeah this this demo branch uh, that we want to to, to test um, what has been done is that, as you can see here, uh, this mixing station is installed in a regular container. And instead of the uh, regular heating curve, which is uh, in, in cold conditions, there's a supply temperature of 115 degrees um, in that network, uh, in the main Brescia network, which uh, is reduced to 100 degrees when it's quite uh, warm, have 15 degrees outside. And what this mixing station does is it stepwise uh, reduces the supply temperature. That's what has been done uh, so far in the or last winter in this Italian network. Um, this reduction was done in, in two steps. Uh, in the beginning of January, uh, we had a first reduction uh, whereby the the, um, the temperature in the in the network was reduced to supply from about 110 degrees Celsius to about 95. 
And then a few days later, uh, there was a second step, or a few days, I'm, uh, almost a month uh, later, there was a second step in which the temperature was, was reduced to about 92 degrees. Huh? Um, what we saw then was that, and that's shown in this graph, that uh, the thermal energy consumption in the network is reduced. You have the blue line, which is the situation before the temperature reduction, and you have the orange line, which is the situation after reduction. And you see that um, the power that the network consumed is reduced, and that suggests that we have uh, less distribution losses. However, we have to say that the, the amount of test data is still limited at this time. Huh? Uh, now, obviously, we are again on October, so we start now as we speak with the next uh, heating season where we will gather more data, obviously. Um, what we also saw, and that is not a surprise, is that the flow rate in the network was increased. Huh? So again, the blue line is reference, the orange line is what we have now. And of course, we have a higher flow rate. This is due to the fact that the difference between the supply and the return temperature is reduced. And then to, uh, to transport the same amount of, of energy, of power, you will have to increase the flow rate. So this is a drawback. And this, this gives you a little bit more pumping energy and pumping costs, obviously. Uh, nevertheless, if you look at primary energy consumption, uh, you see that we have a reduction of about 10% in the actual period in which we tested. Uh, we go from 122 megawatt hours to about 109. And if you do um, extrapolate to a whole year, uh, then we can we saw that there will be a difference of about 15%, which is actually quite remarkable for this uh, not too... Uh, a um, steep reduction of uh, supply temperature. Um, so these are the conclusions. I think I, I already said um, most of it. So uh, the, the supply temperature juice uh, reduction led to a significant reduction in primary energy consumption. What we also saw is that there's a slight increase of return temperature, which we also can explain but I'm not going to go deeper in this in this presentation because um, then I will run over time. Uh, but we also saw an increase in flow rate due to the small temperature difference. So I hope um, it was interesting. And if you have any questions, you can always contact me. Um, obviously, you also have a website and so on where you can find more information. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dirk. Again, uh, another project where we see that you have some years ahead where you can improve and improve how you lower the temperature in your in your demo sites. So um, we will leave the questions for the debate. But in the meantime, well, while we pass for the next uh, speaker, let me let me ask you something. So uh, you told us or you gave us uh, some figures about the first results you have after one winter. But what is the main lesson you learned after the first first winter of testing, generally speaking? Yeah, well, um, we have to admit that. Um, our project is a bit running um, in delay. Um, and that is due to the fact that uh, what we noticed is if you if you write a project huh, and you start, um, people like like me, which which are engineers, we always think that the problems are technical. But what we learned is that actually most of the problems are not technical. Huh? Um, for example, we want to uh, install this this smart uh, controller, which would activate the thermal mass in the buildings, and then you rely on cooperation of the people living in the in the different apartments. Um, so you need a lot of discussion with your with your end consumers, and that takes time, and that also can delay projects. 
And actually, in the beginning, we had three demonstrators, and we lost one demonstrator also because of non-technical issues. So um, there's a lot of uh, uh, of of problems CD there. I think in technical stuff. Yes. 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 Technical okay. technicality well. is not a problem. Uh, when we when we go to the debate, uh, we can deepen on this because uh, uh, I will tell you, I will show you which was the result of the poll, and you will see how today we have most of our attendees belong to the scientific community and to the industry. We don't have uh, any public body or or. Which, which are the, the or citizens or very little, which are the ones, as you said, that uh, have to uh, help us to, to, to achieve the improvement of all these technologies. But well, we'll see it later. So thank you very much, Dirk. Uh, we You're are welcome. going to move uh, for, the, for the next presentation, where uh, Georg Hamam from ENSO We'll speak uh, around 10 or 15 minutes about the Match Up project. And with his presentation, we will finish this very first section of the workshop. And I invite you, attendees, to uh, write your questions in the question. Um, in the question poll that you have there, and we will come with them in the when when Gerg finishes. So thank you very much, Gerg. The floor is yours. Yes, um, thank you, Carolina. First of us, uh, first of all, the, uh, the technical issue. Um, can you hear me? And do you see my slides? Uh, yes, Gerg. We can see you. We can hear you, but we cannot see our slides yet. Oh no. Sorry. Mm -hmm. um, if you want, I can send the. Okay, now we can see your slide. Perfect. All right, fine. Perfect. Uh, yes, hello, everyone. Um, we just uh, heard about very interesting projects all over Europe um, that aims to save energy or to uh, increase the efficiency uh, of systems and give a contribution to a sustainable environment. Um, let me give you an overview about uh, a project in the big uh, EU funded project matchup that we focus on and that I think um, it uh, perfectly fits in here too. Uh, it's about uh, transforming uh, our um, DH system, our district heating system into sustainable yeah, into a sustainable system and uh, to lower the temperatures in the grid. Uh, so you can see um, it's quite similar to Dirk Van Hout's project Tempo. So we we have investigations um, um, in our grid system too. And uh, yeah, maybe I I'm sure I can complement his presentation with my experiences. Um, yes, but. Before we come to the technical part, uh, please let me give you a short overview about the big EU MatchUp project. So I got a slide for you. Uh, what is MatchUp? What does it mean? Um, MatchUp, that means um, maximizing the upscaling and replication potential of uh, high level urban transformation strategies. So um, it's a large, uh, scale project, a collaborative project with several uh, project partners all over Europe. You can see them here. Um, and uh, together in a consortium, we are uh, we explore the uh, transformation of urban structures into smart cities. Um, yeah, and therefore we defined an urban test di district in uh, some cities all over Europe. Uh, to implement uh, different actions in it. Um, we develop uh, concepts in the field of energy efficiency, digitalization, uh, decentralization, renewable energies and um, electromobility. Um, yes, and the uh, implementation of 
such uh, intelligent technologies contributes to create sustainable a sustainable environment for the citizens. So um, the question about matchup is how to increase and uh, multiply the potential of urban change strategies in Europe. Um, we are 28 partners all over Europe. You can see some of them, some of the uh, some of their logos uh, here on the left side. Uh, and uh, I think we're more than 100 uh, project members that per participating in the project. Um, and uh, Dresden, where I am from, is one of three lighthouse lighthouse cities, so-called lighthouse cities, um, in Europe that first introduce these act uh, these actions and um, the resulting measures that comes out uh, serve as a model for other cities in Europe, uh, which you can see here in, in Belgium, in North Macedonia, in Finland, and in Israel, and they um, they want to uh, adapt our um, results in future. Yeah, the project started in uh, October 2017. You can see here uh, the the three major mayors of uh, the lighthouse cities from Valencia, Dresden, and from Italia. Um, yeah, and uh, on the right side, uh, I wanted to show you uh, our Dresden team that consists of um, the city of Dresden itself uh, from the local energy supplier Dreivag, where I'm from, technical university, research institutes, public transportation, and so on. Yeah, okay, the uh, project will last to um, October tw uh, 2022. Uh, so we are, we have nearly half time now. <laughs> okay, uh, so let me focus uh, on one action in particular. Uh, which is in the scope of this matchup project. Um, it's about greening the heat supply of Dresden. That means um, uh, the heat supply of um, municipal buildings, private households, um, industry and uh, industry processes. Uh, well, our corporate motivation is to save uh, CO2 uh, for political, for social reasons, for economical reasons, for sure. And uh, therefore we want to increase the share of uh, renewable energy sources, RES, uh, in the Dresden heat supply. So I guess we all know that um, RES are volatile, they are um, fluctuating. So in order to increase the share of RES, we must rely on uh, sector coupling in the future. Uh, sept sector coupling means uh, linking the various sectors of energy industry and uh, viewing the energy generation and uh, the energy um, consuma consumation, consumption um, as an integrated system. Yeah, and this is what we try, connecting different sectors from energy generation, even in the heat supply. And uh, yes, the, the district heating system uh, itself is a perfect example for this. Um, Dresden has one of uh, the oldest district heating systems in Germany. Uh, it's about 600 kilometers long and um, we're still expanding it. We're still um, modernize it continuously. Yes, and um, nearly 89% of the heat energy in Dresden that is generated uh, uh, is generated in uh, CHP plants, uh, combined heat and power plants. So our share of RES is already very high, but um, we still want to reduce the part of conventional uh, energy generation. We still have some parts of, um, um, what is it? Um, uh, oil and uh, gas that is not uh, used in CHP plants. And uh, yes, so we want to become more greener in future as we are now, nearly 200%. So uh, we concentrate on different tasks uh, that you can see here on this slide. Um, one of our action is to expand the existing heat storage tank 
in uh, one of our heating power plants. Uh, you can see a picture of, the, uh, of this uh, action here. Um, and in this heat storage tank, uh, we installed um, an intelligent measurement system that um, gives us information about the heat layers in the storage itself in a, in a very high solution. Uh, yes, uh, the second part of um, our uh, of our investigation is uh, to look for new places for solar thermal plants in uh, in the city. Um, yeah, and this is quite difficult because um, we need big areas for solar thermal plants, and uh, we all know that <laughs> a place a space is um, limited in the city. Uh, so we didn't find a place yet. We had something under investigation, but uh, yeah, we are looking for other places now. Uh, and the third action is about uh, the reduction of the inlet temperatures, as uh, Dirk just um, gave us some information about it. Yeah, and uh, I chose one of uh, this action um, to present you more in detail. Um, yes, we call this reduction of temperatures uh, uh, as the field study low X. Um, it's about integrating, uh, integrating RES has to be done uh, at a lower temperature level at about 70 to 90 degrees. So, uh, and our DH system operates at maximum temperatures of 130 degrees. So the whole system is dimensioned to supply the demand at this temperature at up to 130 degrees. Um, and um, if we reduce the temperatures, uh, that would make the handling of the whole system more difficult with, uh, yeah, with the uh, increasing share of RES. So uh, what we did is um, we started a field study um, to reduce the inlet temperatures by 10 degrees Celsius um, to 105 degrees. So it's it's not every time we run the system at 130. Uh, when we had this field study, we had lower temperatures. Um, yeah, we reduced the temperatures at the power plant side and um, in order to better fit in the low temperature heat from RES. Um, yeah, and uh, to lower the inlet temperatures um, of the entire system, uh, we had to, in advance, we had to solve legislative issues. Uh, we had to do uh, theoretical investigations uh, calculations and uh, just like Dirk said, uh, some um, detailed simulations, for example, of the pressure losses uh, under these um, standard and under test conditions. Yeah, and all this pre-work confirmed the feasibility. Um, so the next step was to uh, equip the system with additional hardware in order to get more measurement data uh, and uh, all the information about the grid behavior, it's, uh, the grid behavior itself. Yeah, and um, to install all these measurement systems that lasted a couple of weeks. Yeah, and uh, after this was done, we uh, defined a test week in March this year, and uh, then we had two reference weeks uh, before this test week uh, to compare the data. Yeah, so it was just one week we had the simulation, but um, yeah, the main topics to investigate uh, are, were, uh, they, they were um, the um, hydraulic behavior of the whole system. What's about the, uh, the heat losses? We expected um, a reduction in the exergetic heat losses. Um, what's about the uh, handling of the storage? what's uh, the reaction of the uh, components of the power plants. Yeah, and um, for this purpose, um, we uh, had this, uh, this comparison weeks uh, before and uh, after the test week itself. And that helped us to compare the low X um, reference scenarios. Okay, um, 
So what came out? Um, first of all, the field study is not completed, completed yet. Uh, the test drive itself, uh, that means lowering the temperatures, is, took place in March, but we are still evaluating the data. We have huge amounts of data uh, that still has to be analyzed, and uh, therefore we are, uh, yeah, uh, the evaluation is still ongoing. Uh, we could determine some savings in CO2, not from the lowering the temperatures itself, but for example, for expanding the heat storage in our system uh, from April to August in this year. Uh, we uh, had savings in CO2 uh, of about 62 tons. So in, in a couple months, we just saved 62 tons of CO2 only with expanding the, the storage. Yeah, and um, well, actually we expected a significant change of the return temperatures um, but um, yeah because if you lower the inlet temperatures as Dirk said um, to in order to uh, to get the constant heat uh, flow uh, the, the return temperatures uh, should um, lower itself too but we couldn't see a real correlation between the data um, so this is why um, um, we think that um, the dynamic behavior of the whole system is more complex as we expected and further investigations has to be done, ha have to be done. Um, yeah, we have to look on the customer's side. So that means we have to analyze the operation mode of um, the, customer's uh, the customer's behavior or um, how they run their uh, components. Um, so in future, it's becoming more and more important that we reduce the inlet temperatures of the system below 105 degrees. So we we are not as low as um, Dirk is in his project. We are not at 75 degrees or no, sorry, uh, as I think it's, it was 95 degrees. Um, yes, but we're looking forward to go lower our temperatures in order to better integrate all the energy from RES. Um, yeah, why are we doing this? So it's our way to offer green environmental friendly heat supply in Dresden and the majority of uh, private households is dependent on our heat generation in Dresden. So it's a good chance for us to raise a high potential of energy savings and um, increase the efficiency of the supply. Yeah, uh, that's why we do this. We are still on this topic. We're still under investigation, um, but there's much research to be done to lower the temperatures. Yeah, so this is it in a short um, about our project. Uh, I think I'm a little bit delayed. I'm sorry, but uh, yeah, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask me. Uh, thank you very much, Georg, for your presentations. And uh, as you used a little, a couple of minutes more, uh, let's move uh, for the for the discussion part. We have now 20 minutes uh, ahead of us. Uh, for the for the attendees to to make questions, uh, don't uh, hesitate to speak, ask for to speak or write the the, the questions. Otherwise, I will have uh, I have some questions for you. But before going to that, uh, we are going to propose uh, a poll and uh, two additional polls. Uh, that will help us, if you don't have questions, that will help us with the discussion. So we are going to propose you, give you like 30 seconds to answer, to, to, to choose one, a maximum of two options for the following uh, questions. Uh, what, do you, what do you think are the main barriers to the decarbonization of district heating and cooling six systems? Are those barriers technical, political, regulatory, financial, economic, or social? 
So you can choose one or two options and that will help us to understand uh, which is the, the point of view of our attendees. And if you don't make questions, we will discuss about this. Uh, let me give you, yes, uh, like 10 more seconds or 15 more seconds to answer. Uh, we don't vote, so it's only the attendees voting. And then let's move to another poll uh, where we are going to propose you another question. Uh, the, the, the question will be, uh, um, which actors play the biggest role in driving the integration of renewables in the district heating and cooling networks? Again, you can choose a maximum of two options and the options are network operators, producers, policymakers, consumers, prosumers, or local authorities. Uh, again, uh, you have like uh, 15 seconds or something like that to answer. And uh, well, I see that uh, you are still voting. Let's see if there is any additional vote. And then we we close. No one is voting, so let's close the poll. So while we uh, receive the the answers uh, or the, the the results of these polls, uh, let me see if there are any questions. And if there are not, I have some questions for the for some speakers who didn't have the chance uh to to have their question so i'll start by uh, maria victoria from acciona and the wheel district project so maria victoria i would like uh to ask you uh, i see that uh, your your demo projects are spread all around europe so uh, i would like to ask you if you have seen if there are many differences in the implementation of district networks, not, not energy efficient, energy renewable energy supply, but in the networks throughout Europe, this is one question. And the other questions is uh, what type of energy do they use? Uh, okay. It's a very big question, an open question, but let, let us give us some light on that, please. Well, yes, in fact, maybe uh, other um, uh, panelists can also contribute to this answer. So what uh, we can see is that, uh, well, uh, district heating and cooling in European countries are at a very different uh, development uh, stages. So uh, there are some countries with a small share uh, of district heating, uh, such as uh, the Netherlands, uh, France, uh, or Spain, <laughs> uh, Portugal, and uh, in general, these countries have a high share of individual heating uh, systems with uh, high shares of fossil fuels, uh, mainly uh, natural gas. Uh, there is a lack uh, of awareness and uh, um, practical knowledge of how to implement uh, this kind of system. And uh, this is reflected also in the lack of uh, uh, legislative and uh, regulatory frameworks and, and master plans. So uh, what I know better is uh, the Spanish case, so <laughs> I'm from Spain. Uh, here we have a small amount of kilometers of network. It's an emerging market, let's say. However, most of the district heating are fed by renewable energy sources so, and biomass mainly. So we are later, although more sustainable. Um, other example is maybe in the Netherlands. Um, the district heating has not been developed due to very strong competition from uh, the own uh, natural gas sources. Uh, which uh, has uh, low prices, but uh, this policy how uh, now uh, has changed uh, due to different reasons, the climate change, which is something uh, generalized, but also uh, particular problems with uh, earthquakes in Groningen in the, in the Netherlands, so it's another thing that can happen. And uh, well, then there are other countries in Europe that uh, with a large share of district heating, uh, system. Uh, Denmark is the most uh, representat representative, uh, well, the, the reference for the district heating system, or uh, Sweden. Uh, 
um, for these countries, the, the expansion of the district heating is not the primary focus area, but uh, the increase in the overall energy efficiency of the network by using the renewable sources or, or any new technologies. And then, uh, for instance, in the um, and it's the, in particular in the district, we have uh, some example of uh, Eastern European countries that have uh, old systems, so old pipes, old systems, and we need to be retrofitted, needs to be renovated and optimized to reduce the, the heat losses and also losing customers. So we see that uh, we have a map uh, of different alternatives around, around Europe. So I don't know if uh, other speakers want to add something uh, here. Uh, at the well, and the, the, how is the their view? And but this is how we see uh, well, at least from with this project, uh, because we we did the first view about the, the status of the district in Europe, and uh, this is more or less what uh, I could uh, explore. Thank you very much, Mavi. I see there is another question for for you. Uh, uh, the, someone is asking, Antonio, in fact, Antonio Garrido is asking what technology is used for the first cooling unit you presented? What technology? I, I, I don't understand what you mean with technology. Technology, do you mean, in, well, uh, the RACU, the renewable air cooling unit, uh, That's right, because you presented two. The second one you say was absorption, but uh, yeah. I think ah. which one was the first one? Yeah, the first one is uh, you can see as an HVAC system, um, but we don't use uh, refrigerant, but only air and water. So inside that uh, black box, um, we use, uh, well, maybe this is too technical, but we use a uh, evaporative system and a desiccant wheel. So we are moving yes, okay. around the psychometric uh, uh, diagram. Yes, yes, okay, okay. Okay, now you understand. So maybe this is Thank too, you. too technical, but yeah. Okay. okay, so I think Antonio received uh, his answer. So now uh, we are going to move. Um, we are going to move to Jack because uh, I had a question for him regarding the reward heat project. Um, do you think that heat can be sold as a service instead of a commodity? What's your opinion on that? Yeah, thanks, Carolina. Yeah, so. As I mentioned in my presentation, this is one of the things we're looking at in the project. Um, so our aim is to for thermal energy to be sold as a service rather than viewed as a commodity um, and how this will affect end consumers. So this relates to the idea of thermal comfort um, and the provision of an optimum indoor climate rather than just supplying um, heat and cold to end consumers. Um, so the local intraday storage solutions that I mentioned um, are, will be used to provide demand side response. Um, and this is important to adapt to customer needs quickly um, and ensure that this optimum indoor climate is always maintained. So the main focus is on the management of the building energy use beyond the substation. Um, so we've seen this trend is developing in Nordic countries and our aim is for business models to be evaluated for each of our eight demonstrator sites. Um, and then the comparisons will provide insights about how we can transition from high temperature networks to low and neut neutral temperature networks. And this idea of heat as a service ties in with the, um, the focus on the, the green dimension of investments in low temperature networks. Um, and how this can be used to leverage institutional investment um, from venture capital funds and pension funds and things like that. So yeah, I hope that's answered your question, Carolina. May I also ask how you charge for the services? Maybe like a flat rate or I don't know how you pretend to, to charge the customers for the service? Yeah, so it depends on the type of customer um, and obviously this will be ad hoc depending on um on each of the demonstrator sites and the number of customers in their network but yes the plan is to um convert kind of um the we'll look at kind of historical heating demand and um the space heating requirement over the last year and this will be used to generate a flat rate um within that network and obviously will there'll be changes within each demonstrator so we can find 
um, the optimum business model and yeah, there'll be experimental approaches within each so that we can make comparisons and recommendations on what is the most appropriate business model for um, for heat as a service. Interesting. Thank you. Jack, is there anyone else from the attendees or speakers who are interested on this question? If not, uh, I have an additional question for Georg uh, from ENSO uh, related to the Match Up project. Uh, While well, you, uh, together, together with Dirk, you spoke about the low temperature networks, but what do you think are the limits to reduce the temperature of a heating system? What or where are the limits, Georg? Uh, well, yes, there are limits. Um, we cannot lower uh, the temperatures of the DH system as we want. So we, we cannot um, lower it randomly. Uh, there are several barriers that limit our um, our investigations. Um, first of all, um, the, the most important thing is uh, the quality of the heat supply. So it must not be affected by our field studies. Um, we have to guarantee a constant heat supply um, and an, yeah, a constant heat supply and a high qualitative heat supply for uh, for the citizens in Dresden. Um, and then um, um, there are uh, limits on the supply side. So that means on the, um, on the power generating side, uh, because plant components, they operate in a specific, um, in specific states and in, in specific uh, conditions. And uh, the components are, uh, yeah, they are allowed to run in, in specific operation ranges. So we have to pay attention um, not to to operate in unsecured um, running modes of these components. Otherwise, we lose guarantee, maybe for the um, for the steam turbine or something. Um, yeah, I think this is a an important point. And then there are uh, limits on the uh, on the customer side, um, we have some customers that run uh, absorption refrigerators, so cooling machines that run with um, thermal energy. And uh, these refrigerators, they are connected to the DH system in Dresden and they need a minimum temperature. So in order to um, lower the temperature by 95 degrees, we have to pay attention what uh, happens to these uh, refrigerators. Um, otherwise we get uh, trouble with our customers. Yeah. <laughs> um, and yeah, let me focus on one point. Um, maybe there are um, economical issues that limit um, the inlet, uh, the reduction of the inlet temperatures. Um, just like Dirk said, uh, we have to keep a constant heat flow in order to um, fulfill our um, supply um, obligations. Uh, and if we reduce the inlet temperatures of the grid, uh, we theoretically have to increase the uh, mass flow rate. Uh, so the pump work rises. The pump work uh, that is necessary to circulate uh, the heat medium in the system. Yeah, and that means on the one hand, you have um, the reduction of uh, of exergetic losses, and on the other hand, side, you have um, rising pump work to circulate, and uh, therefore the whole action uh, becomes kind of an um, an optimization uh, issue, an optimization problem. So we have to find this point where um, the exergetic losses are at the highest point and the pump work is still acceptable for us. Yeah, yeah, and this is quite simple. We have to analyze some more um, boundaries um, to find this point, to find this operating point of the grid. Um, yeah, and we didn't reach our aim, but we are close to it, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, maybe this Thank are- Thank you very much. Yeah, okay, sure. 
Okay, Gerald. Now uh, we don't have much time, so uh, let me share with you the panelists because you didn't vote on the attendees the result of the of the two polls that we we proposed. So the first poll was related to the main barriers. So which 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 did you think? Uh, were the main barriers for decarbonization in the district heating and cooling networks. And, uh, well, most of attendees, 90%, uh, well, you, you could choose two, two, two options. So 90% uh, chose financial and economic barriers and 50% technical. So I would say that most of our, our, our attendees believe that those are the main two barriers for decarbonization. So what's your opinion on this? And I, I, I leave it open to all the panelists to give their opinion, just uh, 30 seconds maximum, because we want to see the second poll. But uh, what's your opinion on this? I, I, Marco from Stump here, I'm the next session panelist, but I, I have okay. a very strong opinion in this. And I think that uh, the financial and economic aspects are definitely uh, the most relevant as they impact also the uh, social component. So uh, especially the uh, average Joe you see in the street will not perform any action unless, you know, he has a direct feedback in his uh, wallet. That's my opinion. Uh, so I mean, you agree with, with the attendees, so you are all aligned. Uh, sorry, yes. I was going to speak. No, yes, yeah, sorry, uh, Carolina, this is Maria Victoria from Axion. I, just, I would like to add one remark here because uh, from my expertise, uh, one of the main barriers that we are uh, finding for implementing the, the Wigistic project in particular are more aligned with the regulatory uh, uh, points because, uh, well, we need to um, request for licenses and permissions and this is something that sometimes uh, is a block mess. And uh, remembered also the presentation done by Dirk uh, when uh, he mentioned that the technical issues were not the, the worst. Um, I think that, uh, I don't know, maybe, um, I, okay, I agree with the attendees because the financial and economic, of course, and also uh, there's a also social component. But uh, sometimes I would say that the technical uh, barrier is not uh, the more representative barrier for uh, our, uh, our solutions. This is uh, my point of view. Okay. Yeah. Well, I I I would add the following, which is uh, we also we all think that maybe maybe social uh, barriers, regulatory barriers, with the pass of time can be can be let's say uh, achieved. But once you get to the financial and economic uh, thing then it's a yes or no. So maybe uh, that's why uh, well, most of our, our attendees have this, this opinion, but well, well, thank you. Uh, thank you yeah. all. And then let's move yeah, to the follow-up. Oh, sorry, sorry. We can, yeah, I we just can... Want... yes, oh, yes. Go I ahead. just want to comment on, uh, on your last uh, statement eh, that, that economic is difficult. Uh, which is true. However, obviously, the, the costs of uh, of global warming are not internalized in energy costs. Exactly. And that, is, yes. that is probably one of the main reasons. Eh? If we would come up with, with things like uh, CO2 taxes and so on, our uh, yes. district heating systems change. and also, yes, yes, it could change. And, and, and that is the way to, to go to in the longer run, I think. To overcome this. And that, that's I, I, maybe connected I, I, to the regulatory thing. I mean, if there was some kind of regulation like like, like pricing CO2 emissions, then yes. that would help a lot to make it financial feasible. Sorry, yes. someone was going to add something or let we move to the next poll. Uh, this is Antonio Barrida from Tecnalia. I, I was going yes. to see. Same. This is political because uh, the the cost of the long term of the fossil fuels is going to be higher right now. So the economic on the short term could be one of the barriers. But this is only because the political is not uh, pushing on these aspects. So I, I totally agree with the the comment. Uh, one more thing is also social. I just want to add one um, a lesson learned from the project we we are facing. 
is that some uh, people are uh, installing heat pumps for cooling, and since, since they are reversible, they prefer to use their heat pump at, at home uh, rather than the district heating. They have connection both for the individual heat pump and for the district heating. And for, uh, sometimes in winter, we are seeing that they are they prefer to use the. They don't know if it's cheaper or it's uh, cleaner, but they are using the heat pump because it's uh, where, what they rely on. So social is also a very big uh, issue here. Issue. Yes, you are right. Thank you, Antonio. Uh, let's move to the next poll because if not, uh, we are going to to get time from the other attendees, from the other speakers. Sorry. Oh, oh no. Let's do it. Uh, sorry. Let's do it on, on the next uh, discussion part. Because if not, uh, Marco and the others won't have time to present their, their project. So, well, uh, thank you very much uh, to all speakers from the first section. Now we move uh, uh, to the second section where we are going to see three uh, research and innovation projects related to sustainable urban regeneration model development demonstration of smart city technologies in energy transport and ICT. So the first speaker is uh, Marco Barbagelata from STAM, who is going to uh, tell us and, and give us an introduction and an overview of the Dream Pack project. So Marco, the floor is yours. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, Carolina. Can you all see uh, my screen and hear me? Yes, Marco. Perfect. Oh, beautiful, beautiful. So first of all, good morning, everybody, and thank to the previous speaker for the interesting talks. Uh, as Carolina said, I will. Uh, I am Marco Barbagelata. I am uh, the ICT area manager for STAM, uh, and I am presenting the uh, DreamPack project, which, as the name says, is uh, focusing on demand response, and in particular, it stands for Unified Demand Response Interoperability Framework, enabling market participation of active energy consumers. Um, the project is coordinated by CERT, the uh, Greek Research Institute, and it is based, it is focused, let me, next slide, okay. It is, it aims to enable the participation of small prosumers, so uh, building level mostly, uh, in both implicit and explicit demand response program uh, within a future electricity market environment. So uh, also this is closely related to the to the poll that we have sent, although it's not necessarily the HC, but it's the R in this case. Uh, our aim is uh, to enable demand response uh, tackling regulatory standards, technical and social aspects, and we decline this in uh, three main challenges. Uh, so the first one is to create a grid to market communication system. Uh, the second one is to develop interoperable smart building EMS. And the third one is to increase the overall uh, energy demand flexibility of buildings. Uh, we translated these challenges into three objectives. Uh, so number one, uh, like the Daniel in the introduction said, it's of course uh, technological. So uh, to develop and deliver the DreamPack solution as an interoperability technological enabler for small prosumers demand response. And we will see that later in mostly the architecture. Uh, define innovative business models, as I said, uh, a lot of the uh, aspects that uh, are making things move are related to financial and economics. And last but not least, of course, demonstrate and validate via piloting and market testing on real users. So speaking of uh, real users, uh, the project uh, features four, uh, four demonstrators. Uh, one is in Spain, one is in France, one is in Germany, and one is in, one is in Cyprus. Uh, we also have one, uh, what we call it, pre-pilot testing in uh, at CERT uh, facilities in uh, in Greece, and that's where we uh, pre-test a lot of our technologies and tools before we actually deliver them to the to the actual uh, demonstrator cases. And our goal, as I said, is to develop the ICT infrastructure to enable services and devices interoperability uh, among energy market stakeholders. So. Our goal is to allow demand response, so to allow uh, consumers to behave in a way that is uh, increasing the resilience and the stability of the electricity grid uh, through implicit demand response and explicit demand response. Um, the demonstrators are in a way representatives of uh, the targets of the project. So we are tackling three part uh, particular flexibility sources. Uh, number one, uh, residential building, introducing demand response functionality to smart homes or smart homes. 
the second one is a tertiary building, so achieving interoperability with all main building control and automation standards and protocols in the domain. And last uh, but not least, of course, uh, district level energy resources, uh, so facilitating proper and standards compliant uh, DER and integration of district level DR services. Uh, so basically, uh, our uh, it's uh, let's say the, the core of what we're doing is uh, is technical, but we are trying to connect different stakeholders so that the technology will necessarily have uh, market aspects and social aspects. Uh, the, the three pillars that are going to allow this are what we call an interoperability layer, an automation layer, and of course, what is making everything possible is uh, smart energy metering. Um, I talked about the, uh, the technological part a little, so now I want to get a, a bit more in the detail uh, without getting too much into the detail on the, the main components of the DreamPack solution. It's uh, uh, built upon three uh, main pillars that you see here, one, two, and three. Uh, the first one is, uh, we could say, the, the interface with the uh, DSOs energy and energy retailers, and is what we call the uh, DR facilitator layer, uh, which is uh, what actually allows uh, to connect and collect the stimulus that, uh, that trigger actions related to demand response. Uh, the second one, is basically a big inter interoperability layer, uh, what we call the building interoperability layer, and its job is to make sure that uh, different tools can communicate on an ontology base without you know, uh, focusing too much on uh, standards. Last but not least is the building supervisory and automation layer. This is where we interface with uh, the part that you see here on the far right, that is the uh, proprietary vendor specific solution. So actually what is making things happen in the building. Uh, so as you can imagine, this is a fairly uh, complex architecture, but on one side we have uh, what makes, uh, what takes the inputs from, from the grid. Uh, in the middle we have something that uh, translates them into readable languages and control. And here we have what is making the control happen and allows to interface with different uh, solutions, local solutions. Um, so as I said, it's a fairly complex infrastructure. Here, I just want to take uh, 30 seconds to say what's uh, what's been done already uh, by the technical partners of the project. And uh, what we have is that the ICT backbone for the connectivity of uh, distributors, aggregator, the platform and the assets is uh, complete. Hypertech, one of the key technical partners of the project, uh, have developed their energy management system, including uh, smart boxes, boxes and local IoT monitoring. Uh, so this is covering uh, two of the key pillars that I was talking about earlier, uh, the interoper interoperability and the smart metering. Uh, the University of Cyprus platform, uh, specific for one use case, is, uh, will be used and interface with their commercial BMs. Uh, and then on the bottom, we have uh, uh, information related to um, features of features, let's say features of components. So, uh, we have we can guarantee open ADR communication between the aggregator and the building assets. Uh, we have extended uh, the current VTN and VN uh, EI report, and we have uh, developed several uh, data-driven software components, mostly to uh, spot and highlight uh, sources of flexibility within the loads so on the demand side. Uh, as as I said, that it came out during the during the poll as well. Uh, a lot of this is uh, is triggered is uh, triggered by let's say uh, money is triggered by financial uh, stimulus, and this is why a big part uh, of the of the project driven by uh, an ESCO called D7 is in uh, investigating and testing and uh, trying out uh, new uh, business models uh, with regard to the classic I would say ESCO model. And uh, so here I presented uh, three in particular. Uh, the first one is called integrated supplier and aggregator. So basically you have suppliers that optimize the balance position of their portfolio, uh, applying dynamic pricing and provide flexibility to the DSO uh, through a BRP. And the second one is uh, having aggregators that act uh, independently. And so dissociating energy supply and flexibility services and provide flexibility directly to the DSO. And the last one is what we call uh, Flesco. Uh, so basically providing flexibility as a, as a service. So service provider for 
uh, load shifting behind the meter and maximizing prosumers' benefit from dynamic time of use pricing schemes. Mm. I want to add uh, one thing that is not necessarily in the slide here, and that is that, um, of course, we have uh, talked about uh, technology. Here we have discussed a little bit about business models. Uh, another big component that is uh, uh, that is going to happen, it's already happening, but it's going to happen even more as we get to the final parts of the project, is going to be uh, related to the social components that we... Uh, uh, sorry. That we, that we mentioned, and that is uh, the training of people that are going to have to uh, use the technology or anyway be aware of the technologies that are being used. And this is something that STAM specifically will be doing uh, in the next upcoming months of the project. And it's of course going to be uh, coming from a deep knowledge on the technical parts and on the business components. So I will uh, shut up now. Thank you very much for your attention and uh, leave the floor for uh, questions or comments. Uh, thank you, Marco. Uh, may I ask you something uh, related to, to your project? And we already mentioned something about this and you, you insisted on this, but uh, we, what, what is the role of standards and local regulations in the actual implementation of DR measures and stakeholder, uh, stakeholders engagement? Uh, this is a, a good one because, uh, uh, of course, standards and regulation are something that uh, uh, make the integration part of the system uh, mo much more relevant with respect to the intelligent part of the system. And that is that uh, I mean, what I mean by that is that modularity is uh, overcoming a greatly functionality because you have to uh, build an engine that then can be integrated within different standards. And as you've seen, we have a big interoperability layer that guarantees that, but not only technical standards, also market standards. So as you know, uh, in Italian Spain, DR is still something that only um, loosely exists and only for some very specific uh, use cases. While in some other countries, DR is a, a reality and open DR is being used and so on. Uh, so this is uh, impacting a lot on the technical side as a, uh, integration is overcoming, uh, let's say, the development of the actual tool. And the, the other thing is that, uh, what I was mentioning earlier, is that uh, the, the level of, uh, uh, let's say, smoothness that a standard can guarantee in the application of demand response is going to greatly affect how strong of a business model you need and how strong of a training process you need. Because uh, if something is easy and the, the user journey is uh, smooth, of course, it's going to be like this to have it delivered into several use cases. While if uh, standards and market are making it very hard, you need to actually make the users know how important it is in different ways. One of them is money, of course. Thank mm -hmm. you, Carolina. Thank you, Marco. So now uh, let's move to the following project where Matthew, Mathieu Grosjean, <laughs> I don't know how to pronounce this, but from Steinweiss uh, is going to, to speak to us about the Rem, Remo Urban project. Uh, Matthew, or Mathieu, <laughs> the floor Matthew. is yours. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you for the, for the, the introduction. Um, so I'm, I'm a project manager for Steinweiss Europa Centrum, and we were uh, responsible for the exploitation work package uh, in uh, Remo Urban. And I will present you uh, the main result of this project, uh, which is the urban relation model. And it is also related to the, uh, the name of the project itself. Uh, here you, you can see a, a few data about, about the project. Um, we see the three lighthouse uh, cities, which are uh, Tepebashi in Turkey, Nottingham in the United Kingdom, and Valladolid. We see also the two uh, follower city, which are Miskolc in Hungary and Serhan, and uh, we have also two other countries uh, participating or uh, represented by uh, transversal organization, which are Italy and Germany. Um, you can also uh, see uh, the objective uh, reached uh, by the project and several uh, solutions that have been implemented uh, here on this slide. And um, what is important uh, to see is the, is the name or the title of the, of the project, which is Removan, and it stays for Regeneration Model for Accelerating the Smart Urban Transformation uh, of uh, for Smart Cities, our district. 
And this is what uh, we will discuss about. Uh, first of all, um, some general objectives related to uh, the urban relation model. The main objective is to be highly replicable, uh, adaptable, and ad addressing uh, jointly uh, system sustainable districts and buildings parts uh, and energy and the mobility uh, part and also uh, the integrated infrastructure. Um, we can see uh, on the on the right of this slide uh, uh, the different uh, some of uh, the solutions or the category of solutions that have been implemented. We have the technical parts with the different solutions, uh, the decision part, the funds and uh, the insights. And on the left, we have the different um, aspects or main activities um, uh, uh, covered by this uh, urban relation model. So let's let's dive in. And here we can see um, which are the different um, uh, criteria or um, uh, which are uh, or dimensions which are addressed uh, by uh, the urban relation model. Uh, the priority areas that I just mentioned before, uh, the different uh, frameworks uh, which are uh, related to the to the, the, the use of this uh, of this urban relation model and answer the different phases. Um, so here we can see first on the related to the phases, uh, we see that uh, this uh, urban relation model is uh, supporting you or supporting. Uh, the, the, the person who is uh, looking for um, making one district or um, one uh, large company with different buildings or uh, a city smarter um, in the different phases. And we have uh, the strategy design, the action design, and the implementation, and then assessment. And we'll see um uh, face to face what what is included in this uh support of the urban relation model you have also to know that it's not only just a model it's also uh it's also a, um, a connection of dif different uh, software that have been developed uh, in order to give the possibility to very uh, easily and fast uh, come to a good um, plan and uh, have a good or effective implementation of smart solutions. So here for the uh, strategy design, um, the, the urban relation model supports you during the strategy design with collecting information from the city in order to develop a diagnosis. And then thanks to this diagnosis and diagnosis uh, define uh, which are uh, the, the, the needs and, uh, and goals of the city, which enables to define strategic goals or to set strategic goals and uh, then to uh, write down the integrated urban plan necessary to start, uh, to start the, the, the action design phase, where we will have, thanks to this, uh, to this urban relation model, a selection of different smart city technology packages which are uh, related to the needs that have been expressed just before. And then this will give you uh, the possibility to, um, in this uh, smart city technology packages, for example, we have the uh, low temperature district heatings, but of course, uh, the uh, smart city technology packages can be uh, there are a set which are a set of technologies and other solutions that have been uh, uh, brought inside this uh, urban relation model. But there are also uh, the possibility to bring some more uh, thanks to uh, new uh, smart city technology packages that can be included inside this urban relation model. After having had a small selection of uh, smart city technology packages, there is also the possibility to evaluate what will be the effect of this uh, solution. And then, of course, uh, uh, after having had these different uh, potential uh, scenarios, then there will be the necessity for, uh, for the, the, the interested person to select uh, the, the, the right scenarios that needs to be prioritized or needs to be uh, considered. And this uh, will give the possibility to then 
select the right uh, smart city technology packages and uh, bring them inside the action plan, which will bring us to the implementation, where at the beginning of the implementation phase, we will uh, look once more uh, to the interve intervention area and do another diagnosis, taking into consideration the, dis the different parameters that we have to, to consider and the criteria that will be reused uh, within this urban relation model in order to uh, give a clear baseline. Uh, then there will be the development of uh, uh, the intervention uh, design, which will be brought inside the implementation plan. And uh, this model will also support you uh, in the development and the selection of adapted procurement on contract, enabling then the execution and, uh, and the commissioning of the different smart city technologies. Here we could say that uh, the job is done, it's finished, but in fact, this uh, urban generation model will support you not only uh, to implement, uh, to plan, to implement or to select the, uh, the technologies, to implement the, uh, the technologies, but also to uh, assess what is uh, the effect uh, of these uh, different uh, solutions. And uh, if you reach uh, the expectation or you go uh, uh, above, um, this will help you uh, for the monitoring, thanks to different uh, tools which are integrated in this uh, urban generation model and have the different and uh, monitor the different uh, relevant uh, indicators for this for the use of uh, special in indices that we will see afterwards. And then it will help you also by evaluating the sustainability and uh, smartness of the, the, the city uh, or the district or the, the group of, uh, of buildings, and then to uh, validate the strategy uh, that has been defined. We move forward uh, on the frameworks that are here to support the implementation of uh, or the, the, the use of this urban generation model. We have uh, one framework related to management. Here you can see uh, the different uh, structures or the different groups of, uh, of uh, people or of expertise that are necessary in order to uh, use this uh, solution or this uh, urban generation model effectively. We have here the evaluation part where we have the uh, different indexes uh, related to the city level with the sustainability and the smarter. This is what could be uh, monitored and uh, further uh, studied uh, by this uh, urban generation model thanks to the style tool. Um, and there is also a demo site index uh, at, the, at the project level which is uh, considering the implementation that you have brought uh, thanks to this urban generation model. Here you can see that we have also uh, uh, a, finance, a finance framework, which is related, from which enables you to, uh, to make some evaluation or estimation of, uh, of the implementation of the, different, um, of the different technologies or the different solutions. And it is also here to support you to follow the different uh, um, investment that you had during the project and to select or uh, get supported with different uh, innovative financing schemes. So, yeah, that's it for my side. Um, if you want to know more about it, uh, first of all, you've got um, an information package which has been uh, which has been uh, brought uh, inside this uh, this. Um, uh, this uh, presentation or this uh, this room. Um, we've got also uh, an electronic book which is uh, available or ebook which is available on the uh, Remoban website. So please do not hesitate to look at it. There is also a, a web seminar that uh, is available on YouTube. Um, if you want to know more about uh, the, the, the the project, do not hesitate to go on Remoban website. But you have also uh, several uh, several uh, person who are able to answer your question. Uh, of course, myself. If you have a, a further question or if you need to be uh, directed to the right person related to the different technologies that have been implemented, because the project removal, as I explained, is already uh, done, finished, 
And here you can see if you want some more information related to the urban orientation model, uh, we've got here uh, two partners, Denier Energy and Cartif, and you have also the name of uh, the person that you can contact about it. And uh, yes, so please do not hesitate. Uh, we will be more than happy to support you and uh, enable you to make uh, your district, your group of buildings, or your city smarter. That's it from, from us then. Thank you, Mathieu. Uh, well, I have a question, one you almost already answered, but uh, uh, let me ask you, uh, so could you tell us uh, as a summary, why should we be, why should we use or be interested in, in this model? And then if we are, or someone is, uh, who should we contact? Yes, um, I think for the second part of the question, you have the answer on this uh, on this uh, on this uh, screen. Um, but uh, of course, you have also this, uh, the answer in the different uh, documents, um, because uh, the the one that I presented in the slide before, uh, in these documents, uh, you have some more information about the person to to be contacted and so on. Um, related to the second part. Um, Yes, it's a it's a it's a good question. Uh, why should we be interested by uh, such a such a tool or by such a, a model? Uh, is it um, what does it bring? In fact, uh, this model is uh, very. First of all, the, the good point is it is it is comprehensive. Um, is uh, it is very systematic and uh, supporting uh, supporting you for from the beginning of the of the project uh, of the the ID generation about are related to smart city or becoming smarter and until the end of this uh, of the project until the the assessment and the, the closing or the closure of the of the project it is also um, flexible because you can you can use this uh, tool uh, at the ID generation but you can use this uh, this tool for for the um, designing phase or the, the planning of the of the smart city or during the implementation you can also benefit from this so you can you can come in uh, or use this uh, this uh, part for a part of this uh, urban relation model at any time where you are uh, during your implementation and also for the assessment you can you can use it and it is also um, quite fast uh, and uh, and effective uh, this is also the, the saving resources uh, there because with this uh, this urban relation model you will uh, have the possibility to select uh, solutions uh, very quite rapidly uh, without uh, having too uh, too many uh, too much hesitation looking uh, having the possibility to to screen different solutions which are really the the right one for the the needs that you you mentioned and you are supported by softwares um, which makes it very effective in the in the selection and the collection. Um, it is also um, adaptable because you can bring some new solutions inside of it, as I explained, some new smart city technology packages, um, and this will broaden the the, the, the spectrum uh, or the the, the possibility uh, offered by this uh, urban relation model. The other good point is uh, it's uh, it's a uh, Full of knowledge, knowledge of five different cities that uh, uh, implemented uh, different smart uh, smart solution and uh, used this model to to see how uh, to improve it and uh, make it uh, effective. And uh, finally, um, it will probably uh, um, give you the possibility to avoid some mistakes and errors uh, because of this uh, methodology, which is bringing you step by step to the next phase and uh, may help you to consider uh, a lot of different hurdles uh, and uh, to better pass them. Yes, I think that's the reason why this model is so interesting. So I would invite all the attendees to, to try to use it at any stage, <laughs> at any project stage. Well, thank you very much again, and we'll, we'll continue in the discussion part. And then uh, let's move to the last presentation. As you see, uh, 
Time has gone very quickly. I would stay here for hours listening to your projects and your techno technologies and your experiences. But well, now we have the last speaker, Nora Mendoza from Fomento de San Sebastián, who is going to speak about the project Replicate. So Nora, the floor is yours. And, and I hope that you still give us additional information. Thank you very much, Flora, Nora. Thank you, Carlina. Well, thanks a lot to all the attendees for being here today, also to the organizers and especially to you, uh, Carolina. Well, uh, can I, uh, can you tell me, for, uh, please, if you can see my screen, the presentation? And uh, Nora, we could see it for a second, but now it's gone again. Okay, I will try again. Can you see the there, presentation now? There it is, yes. Yes, could you please yes. put it on full screen? Yes, sure. No. It's okay? No. Perfect. Okay, no. perfect, thank yeah. you. Thank you, Nora. Thank you, okay. Uh, I come from the city of San Sebastian, uh, Donostia San Sebastian, smart city, from the municipality of San Sebastian, and uh, more specifically from the Economic Development Department, which is called Fomento de San Sebastian, and is coordinator of Replica Lighthouse Project. Well, we have three different strategic goals in Fomento San Sebastian. We work for, as a, for a city innovation hub, as a, with Donostia as a specialized city, working on smart specialization strategies and also developing smart city projects for a smart branding and positioning um, in the smart field. Well, we are coordinators of Replicate project. Replicate acronym means Renaissance of Places with Innovative Citizenship and Technology. We are a project uh, that was approved in the second call of this uh, lighthouse, uh, smart cities and communication applications um, uh, calls of the European Commission and we were the, the best uh, scored uh, uh, in 2015. Our vision is to increase the quality of life of citizens across Europe by demonstrating the impact of innovative technologies. So we are using these technologies to create a smart city services for citizens and to test the optimal process for replicating taxes in cities and across cities. This is a general overview of our project. As you can see in the slide, uh, we are three lighthouse cities, uh, San Sebastian in Spain, Bristol in United Kingdom, and Florence in Italy. We also have uh, three fellow cities, Essen in Germany, Lausanne in Switzerland, and Nilofer in Turkey, and two observer cities in Bogota, England. With almost 30 million euros, we have a five-year project that is uh, approaching the end because we are started in February 2016 and the project will be finished by the end of January next year. We had the first three years of implementation, so the implementations are already finished and we are in the monitoring phase. And also um, working on business models, uh, apart from monitoring, on uh, and replication and in other transversal activities and also improving all the implementations done uh, in the cities and sharing among all the partners. The three lighthouse cities we already collaborated in a seventh framework program project called STEP about system thinking for comprehensive city efficiency energy planning. It was a planning project. Uh, we took the chance of that project to develop our city's smart plan and it was a participatory process with almost 20, uh, 200 people from different um, typologies and, uh, and different type of stakeholders of the city defining this plan and we chose a specific district of the city where we where we will prioritize uh, our implementation and what that's what we have uh, included in our lighthouse project in replicate this is the consortium we have 10 public organizations, 24 multi-sectorial companies, and five universities working as a team. Well, 
Um, our overview in San Sebastian is to uh, reach a district close to zero emissions and to have a district branding in sustainability. The district uh, will have, uh, where we have been developing all the implementations is called, is called Urumea Riverside. Urumea is the river that crosses the city. And we have three different areas, a residential area, an industrial park with almost uh, 5,000 people working there, and a natural park, the biggest carbon reservoir of the city. So we are working in um, in the transition of this uh, to a smart city in three fields in energy efficiency, in sustainable mobility, and ICT and infrastructure. Our aim is to do a development and validation of a city business model for a sustainable city to be replicated in other towns and districts. Here you can see a picture of the past of the district. Uh, the, uh, there were some floodings. Uh, from time to time, and it was a district developed in the middle of the 20th century with an efficient buildings, connection problems, with a uh, industry location, etc. So there were uh, we have developed different planning uh, processes, and we have developed different um, action plans in order to transform this city. So the replicate takes is part of all this transition to a smart district and it has a, it's been a really huge impact in this transformation so we are implementing different activities with an integrated vision in order to increase the resource and energy efficiency in the district using more renewable resources of energy boost local res resilience reducing greenhouse gas emissions etc regarding the sustainability of the mobility we have improved the connection of the district uh, to the city centers. Also, we have developed several ICT tools and IP services, improving in that way the city management and fostering citizen participation and open data uh, with all the data uh, that it has been provided by the, by the project and all the implementations. Regarding the energy efficiency, we have uh, 156 existing consolidated houses in in that district that has been um, that has been retrofitted under replicate project in addition we have 34 commercial premises where we have also made energy efficiency interventions so these 156 house households were the consolidated um, buildings um, in this district, all the rest are new house, houses, new construction that complete an almost 1,500 houses uh, for, for this district. So all the actions we have done in energy, efficient, in energy efficiency have contributed to the following benefits to improve the comfort. We have also, apart from retrofitting these uh, buildings, we have also connected the, them to the district heating uh, and we have uh, saving on expenses, uh, reduction in CO2 greenhouse gas emissions, reduce uh, also the noise and increased efficiency, improvement in energy rating, et cetera, et cetera. So all this insulation, change of windows, pipe wars, heating, et cetera, has contributed to the benefit of the citizens that live in this district. Also, the, the buildings right now, aesthetically, are more homogeneous with the new buildings, and the housings have been reevaluated. Here you can see a picture of the district heating. It's a centralized thermal energy system for domestic hot water and heating for the complete um, district, not only for the retrofitted homes, but also for the new constructed homes. So we have a centrally generation uh, of, of uh, this uh, energy that is distributed via a network of pre-insulated steel pipes. So we have two biomass boilers and also two gas boilers just for peak demand. And each building has a second network to each consumption point, and this allows its use as an individual installation, but of course, with advantages of centralized production. 
as benefits, we can highlight the improvement in the comfort, that we have lower risk as there are no combust combustion elements in the buildings. We are using biomass from a closed forest. Uh, and also we have a monitoring platform uh, where users, citizens can access to have all their complete information. Of course, the reduction in, uh, in gas emissions is really important uh, thanks to this intervention. Regarding sustainable mobility activities, we have here in the picture the two electric buses that has been in, that connects the district with the city center. And is complemented with uh, another three hybrid buses. So uh, we have really learned a lot with this intervention, and we have been proving all the um, um, implementation during these years, uh, learning how to how to better use this type of vehicles, also um, with the batteries, and how to to um, to work with these buses in extreme conditions as is the case of this line 26 that connects the district with the city center regarding public electric vehicles we have acquired uh, several vehicles and cars and also e-motors for the municipal fleet we are working also with the taxi drivers of the city uh, so moving to these electric vehicles and monitoring all the solutions that are being replicated and scaled up um, uh, in the city. We have also deployed recharging infrastructures, uh, not only in public uh, for the public part, but also in gas stations and parkings. We have developed a mobility smart city platform with advanced mobility services, and we have aggregate behavior analysis in urban mobility, uh, using for it for this uh, data coming from a telephony company in from the Basque country. Regarding ICT and, and infrastructures, we have developed a smart city platform uh, and we are integrating all the municipal services uh, in the platform, all the data. So a big, in, uh, a big infrastructure that has come to stay and to uh, continue um, integrating more and more information from the city and improving the management, municipal management uh, in a collaborative way among all the municipal departments. Also, the open data part is really important and link open data that it's also already available in our web page and a citizen participation platform and services. And the high speed mobile network uh, has been improved in all the cities thanks to Replicate. Omdo San Sebastian is the owner of this infrastructure. And uh, apart from that, another, of, another implementation has been regarding the smart street lighting. So we have now an intelligent uh, system with LED and IP services in the industrial area of the district that is involved in a replicate project. In this last part of the of the project of these five years, we are working on replication on scale up and monitoring mainly. So we have made an analysis from the technical and management point of view. We have made a change among the six uh, Lighthouse and fellow cities and analyzing optimal conditions for extension. So we have done this bench learning process among the cities and we have been taking into account different things like temporal and spatial horizon, horizon definition uh, linked to the policy and vision of each of the cities. We have evaluated the framework, the legislation, regulation, financial instruments that are uh, not always the same in all the in all the countries and cities. We have also uh, made an analysis of the stakeholders' engagement and the assessment and validation of impacts. And business model has been also a, uh, a key uh, aspect that has been taken into account. So here you can see monitoring aspects, also a business business models uh, exercises that we have been developing among our partners and also the smart and sustainable city model developed. So working together as a six cities, not only three lighthouse cities, but also with the three fellow cities, uh, the replication plans are being developed right now in the three uh, fellow cities. And regarding monitoring, we are doing this monitoring at city level, at intervention level, and also uh, integrating 
uh, and sharing all the all the information with with other frameworks, monitoring frameworks as SKIS, etc. At the European level, so we have these monitoring programs for Donosti, Florence, and Bristol, and Bristol available. You have many uh, deliverables already available in our web project web page. Uh, we invite you to to analyze uh, and to go deeper in details if you uh, in the fields you might uh, require. And in the following months, we will be submitting more interesting um, uh, public deliverables that will be available soon. So here you have the contacts, uh, both in replicate and in Fomento San Sebastián and if you might require any additional information we will be glad to share with you. Thanks a lot. Uh, thank you very much Nora. As I mentioned before I could stay here for hours listening to the details of your projects because you had so little time to explain these long-lasting projects where uh, there is design, there is implementation, there is demonstration, there is methodologies, there is monitoring, there are so many things where we can learn, but well, well we are running out of time, so just let me make you one question, and it is, uh, you mentioned something about the citizen engagement, and in fact, in fact, Dirk was telling us that this was like, like a problem in his project. So you, uh, I think that uh, being part of the municipality makes it easier, but could you tell us uh, regarding the retrofitting interve intervention, uh, which strategy did you follow in San Sebastian for the citizen engagement? Was the engagement as expected, or was it better or worse? Or how 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 was that in your specific case? You are muted. Well, it's no, a very no. interesting question. Sorry. Thank you, Carolina. I think it's a. It's... Can you hear me? Okay, it's a very interesting question. I think that it's really a key point in all the cities. It's a challenge. The citizen uh, um, engagement is not easy at all. Uh, even if uh, we we could think that uh, it's a, um, an intervention that improves their lives, their uh, buildings, their houses, is not always so evident because um, they need to be really engaged and they have to also to make some investment and uh, we what we did in replicate was in, in the city of san sebastian what we did is to involve uh, the association the citizens Asso association of the district from the very beginning from the planification part so they were already um, supporting the project with a letter of support when we submitted the the project to the commission before the approval so finally the project was approved and even if the partner we have for the um, retrofitting actions is a private company from the municipality, from Fomento San Sebastian, we, we have been working together as a team and having many, many meetings with the citizens, very transparent, showing them clearly all the funding, all the um, different technological and um, solutions that they could choose uh, were, which were the boundaries, etc. So uh, to go together uh, in this collaboration, public-private collaboration together to the citizens, I think that it has been really important. The municipal um, um, position there, I think that it has been a key aspect. Uh, also the political commitment. So we had our mayor making the first uh, and the councillors in the first meetings with the citizens. So to make a first a clear presentation of the project and then to continue do, doing all this um, follow-up and being present at all the meetings and with the communities etc i think that even if it's a huge effort for the municipality or for Mendo san sebastian i think that uh, at the end of the day what we can say is that we are really happy that we had 100 percent of engagement all the houses of the district on the consolidated uh, citizens were engaged to the project and, and the intervention is done and they are all really happy and enjoying the benefits of in having uh, improved um, houses <laughs> so that was the uh, the objective so really happy 
to see that we, we have uh, achieved this uh, challenge uh, and these objectives. So congratulations, Nora. So well, again, we are running out of time. So uh, we have like five, 10 minutes for discussion. And we didn't have time before to present uh, the last poll where uh, we, were, uh, we were asking the attendees uh, which actors played the biggest role in the driving of integration of renewable energies. We propose you five uh, potential answers and here the, the there has been a big balance between the answers so uh, all of you uh, think uh, that uh, let's say local authority consumers prosumers network operators are the most important uh, actors but the others uh, also uh, play uh, a, a role in the in the integration uh, I would like to ask uh, the panelists, uh, which is their opinion. Do they agree with this? Uh, do they? Do you think that there is some of these uh, actors playing a bigger role in in the integration? What's your opinion? Uh, for instance, uh, I will uh, start by Jack. If you are still there, what's your opinion on this? Hi, thanks, Carlina. Um, yeah, I somewhat agree with the uh, attendees. I'd argue that the the two most important actors are policymakers and local authorities. Um, I think policymakers are the most powerful actors in the system. They can set the framework, the taxes, the targets, and particularly national governments. I think they need to set ambitious targets for the decarbonisation of the heating and cooling sector, and this should be reflected in the national energy and climate plans and then local authorities and city stakeholders um, regularly have more ambitious environmental goals compared to national governments. And I think due to the local nature of heat, local authorities can pursue the development of um, low carbon networks in their locality. Um, and with creative financing and the involvement of a variety of players, I, I think they can deliver uh, sustainable heat locally. Oh, sorry, I was muted. <laughs> sorry, uh, I, I wanted to ask uh, the, the other panelists if you have an opinion. Do you agree with uh, Jack or with the panelists? What's your opinion on the role that the different actors play in the integration of renewables? Hi, Marco. Maybe. Yeah, yeah Marco. No, Go ahead, Marco. I I agree with uh, with Jack, and I think that although it's uh, not the most uh, represented, it has to come from uh, uh, policymakers and local authorities, which is uh, pretty well represented. Uh, so that's that's definitely one component. But the other one is uh, uh, as we are uh, moving towards uh, the integration of renewables, not only in DHC networks but in uh, distributed networks, I think that consumers and prosumers are going to have a role in uh, defining the stability and the resilience of the overall system. Uh, thank you, Marco. Anyone else wants to add something? Yes, we well, can. Uh, yes, sorry. yes, sorry. Yes, this is Dirk here from Vito. Uh, indeed, Hi, policy Dirk. is important. Um, what I would like to add as well is uh, obviously the the owners of the networks, eh? they are uh, very important here. And since since district heating is such a local uh, industry eh, with, with very different traditions all over uh, Europe, um, I mean, what I want to say is you have uh, countries like, like Denmark and also partly Germany where the, the networks are owned by the consumers itself or by the local authorities. The municipalities itself, and there obviously it's 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 easier to integrate or to to step into renewables. Um, but if district heating is operated by by larger private companies and even multi multinational companies, it's it's harder for consumers or for local authorities to uh, 
to make to 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 convince those parties to integrate renewables in their networks. Eh? So it's also a very local um, mm -hmm. local I answer, completely... and that's probably yeah. why it's also so so diverse. This the answer that you see here on the screen. Mm -hmm. So yes, a very good point, and I agree with you. And it depends on the country, it depends on the owner of the network, and um, but well, uh, definitely uh, policymakers uh, may help to to implement for the implementation of renewables, and this is through regulation. And someone mentioned it, and well, we agree, or we all agree. Well, I don't know if any speaker wants, wants to add something, uh, wants to give an additional idea, wants to give something else, because otherwise I think we arrived to the time where we have, let's say, to summarize this workshop. Again, it's for, I thought it was going to be longer and the time has gone by so quickly. So any speaker wants to say something or I ju I'll just give some conclusions. If I may, I would like to ask uh, a few a few words, uh, namely uh, uh, related to uh, the different district heating systems that we, uh, we uh, that were presented. Um, the low temperature district heating, which are more uh, effective for uh, renewable energy sources, um, are difficult to to set up because they are uh, they need usually to be uh, connected to uh, retrofitted buildings and uh, low energy uh, new energy buildings. But uh, actually, there is another another possibility to um, develop low temperature district heating uh, systems, which are connected to the waste heat of uh, existing. Um, uh, existing district heating um, system, and uh, this will uh, would give the possibility to use the waste of this uh, system and uh, fill in uh, fill in low temperature district heating systems and extending actually the the capacity of these uh, systems. Uh, for example, when I see the the the, the system in Dresden. Um, this could be also uh, another way to extend this system and uh, just use the waste and this way not uh, needing some more uh, some more energy or some more fossil fuels, but just using the waste uh, that uh, comes from uh, other systems. So that that was an, a, a suggest, uh, an idea which is uh, related to the project Remoban where we have uh, such a such a system that has been implemented um, and coupled to uh, an existing distributing uh, system. Yep, just a minor intervention. Thank you, thank you. And Carly, um, can, I, can I just add to, sure, sure. to what Matteo said, just in terms of the need for renovation with regard to low temperature networks? Um, I think we heard earlier on that someone mentioned the importance of a district level approach and um, particularly with the re renovation wave, um, one of the new priorities of the Commission, I think it's important to tie in the renovation of buildings with the upgrade and retrofitting of um, district heating and cooling networks um, so that we can move to these fourth and fifth generation networks that are low carbon and more sustainable. Um, so yeah, I think it's important just to emphasize the importance of the, um, the district level approach to deliver positive energy districts. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, I would I like... Uh, Carolina? Uh, sorry, sorry, may I ask something? Yes, yes, yes. sure. <laughs> okay, thank we you. Very I am not lying, but, but go yeah. ahead. <laughs> Okay, I will be very short. Well, yes, um, thank you. Uh, well, coming from a municipality, I uh, I could add that well, uh, cities we can work as demonstrators and trying to show that integrating renewables uh, can be um, really part of the business model and sustainable solution. So uh, we try to work in these public-private uh, models where we can also explore and try to, to be uh, innovative and try to integrate more renewables and, and monitoring and all, with all this data, 
uh, see if we can replicate and scale up this type of solutions in other areas of the cities and be an example also for other cities. So uh, this uh, demonstrator role, I think that can be part of a municipality action that uh, we are trying also to do in San Sebastian. Mm. Okay, thank you, Nora. Uh, well, uh, I think that we we can we should end up uh, here. I would like to ask uh, all all panelists to switch on their cameras so we can take a virtual picture. Uh, sorry, the, Carolina. The, yes, uh, Carolina. There is a question from an attendee, Ricardo. Oh, uh, the sorry. question is to Nora, and now Ricardo is unmuted. So, Ricardo, go ahead. You can ask your yeah. question. Hi, hi, everyone. Yeah, two questions actually. Uh, the first one is we've seen a lot of engagement between uh, structured company and uh, um, uh, local authorities and funding scheme. My question is if young engineers as an idea and if um, like if there is a way to develop it uh, through funding scheme or if uh, the low experience is not enough to get uh, access to the funding scheme where usually you also get uh, technical assistance and if uh, it have never happened. And then to Nora, this is the first question to everyone. And to Nora was like, I've, I've seen a lot of uh, uh, e-mobility uh, development, like uh, bus, electrical bus and vehicles. I was wondering uh, if you have developed also uh, electric, uh, electric charging point to renewable energy. Because I've seen, but I didn't uh, pick up. Yes, thanks. So who wants to answer the first question and then Nora can answer the second question. Any uh, anyone answering the first question? I, I will try to take it. So if I understood correctly, Ricardo, you are asking if uh, uh, basically if uh, with uh, little experience but good ideas, it's uh, easy to uh, access uh, funding, access uh, financing. Is that correct, first of all? Yes. Okay, uh, so the answer is that even with uh, a great experience and uh, a lot of experience, a lot of technical expertise, a lot of people, it's very hard to get uh, this type of fundings that we have been discussing. So the, the success rate for, uh, for European projects, Horizon 2020 projects, is uh, uh, pretty low. It's definitely below uh, 10% possibly also below 5%. So uh, it's tough uh, and it's mo most of the time, as you have seen, it's not related to the expertise or to the ability or the experience of one person or one company. It's usually their co collaborative projects because what wins is yes, the, the, be the best idea, but as you have seen, there's a lot of common ideas. What usually wins is the best, uh, the best team. And I mean, uh, uh, the combination of expertise between uh, SMEs, large enterprises, research organizations, uh, but also uh, demonstrators. So having engaged demonstrators uh, such as uh, the one described by Nora is, uh, is usually the key to prove that what you're going to be done is going to have impact and is going to be relevant. So I think that it's a mix of uh, many things and the best way to approach this is uh, uh, to attend these type of uh, events so that you can build uh, a network around yourself that is winning. Uh, uh, maybe I'm simplifying a bit, but it's a tough question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Nora, could you answer uh, to Ricardo, please? You're muted. Okay. We don't hear you, Nora. Can you uh, hear sorry, her? Nora, we cannot hear you. Well, uh, try again. No, we don't hear you. Well, maybe you can write to Ricardo and answer him because now we are really running out of time. We, we have only three minutes. So, uh, and I had to give some conclusions, but since we ran out of time, I will only say uh, that I, after all these presentations, I see that there is a still a big opportunity uh, of optimism.
optimization of power supply in terms of renewable energies, uh, the installations itself and the new technologies. There is still a, a long way for improvement. Digitalization is, is a key point on all this improvement. Uh, all these projects which are in a different development phases show up that there are uh, that there are real cases that can be scaled up and I would like them to be demonstrators to achieve the, the the neutral carbon target of the European Union and finally I would like to thank uh, the European Commission which is represented today here by uh, Daniel Maraber for pushing for funding these projects that are the basis uh, to achieve this target and now i i only we only have one or two minutes to for daniel uh, to give us a conclusion and to thank you all for your efforts for your for your projects which are fantastic daniel uh, the floor is yours Thank you very much, uh, Carolina. I hope uh, you can hear me. I have to switch uh, my audio device. Uh, can you hear me? We hear you, though we don't see you, but... <laughs> I've, uh, I've connected the camera, so uh, hopefully uh, the image will arrive soon, otherwise you can, you can only the, hear me. Uh, so uh, thank you very much. Charles. Thank you very much for the, uh, for the uh, very interesting uh, workshop. Electric uh, in this Sorry, I think I hear some background noise. I think someone else is uh, talking. There you go. I think that's fine. So thank you very much for this uh, interesting workshop. I, I've taken some notes uh, and uh, just a few words as a, as a, as a concluding remark. So from, from my point of view, we have seen many different projects dealing with uh, different issues from the uh, technical point of view, administrative issues, social issues. Um, and in fact, how these projects are, are, are trying to overcome these barriers is why, act, why actually the, uh, the European Commission is interested in funding those actions because they are the ones that will solve these problems and these uh, current barriers that uh, hinder the, uh, the widespread implementation of these technologies. Uh, that's on the one hand. On the other, we have also seen, and I'm very pleased to see that, uh, we have seen demonstrations all over Europe uh, but we have seen a special emphasis in the countries where the renewable energy and the heating and cooling um, have a, a, or play a, a, a less important role, let's say, in some countries, like or even in countries where there are the heating and cooling systems, but mainly fossil fuel based. So that's also a good thing because there is uh, there is the uh, the emphasis is being put where the uh, where the highest potential is for transformation. And uh, finally, regarding the uh, the uh, the main actors playing the biggest role here in this, I will uh, I will say that of course policymakers and local authorities at the EU level we have seen that in terms of policies um, some regulations and high level policies are being pushed uh, with the previous uh, clean energy package and heat and cooling strategy now to be updated with the more ambitious goals in under under the Green Deal. Uh, and also, of course, we have seen the engagement of, of, the, of local authorities in many of these projects. So I think this is very good news, and, and, and these cities will be the uh, will be the uh, uh, the example to other cities that these things can be done, and it is very interesting for for them to get involved in this type of uh, projects and, and, and innovations. And finally, of course, we uh, should not forget the uh, silent enemy or our silent enemy here, which is. Uh, the uh, very cheap uh, fossil fuels, the very cheap price of fossil fuels currently. So I would say that that's uh, our, 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 uh, our main uh, weak point and, uh, and uh, hindering, hindering the actual deployment of these technologies, uh, besides all the things that have been mentioned here today. So that was basically it. Thanks a lot uh, for the very interesting day and I uh, hope you enjoy the rest of the, the Sustainable Places uh, uh, event. And um, thank you, thank you, Daniel. Thank you, speakers. Thank you, attendees. And well, uh, let's hope that uh, district heated and cooling networks uh, supplied with renewable energy start increasing uh, 
uh, very quickly because there is a big margin for, for doing that. So have a nice day. And well, we hope to see you again in another workshop. And I hope that there is uh, more interest every day on these technologies. Thank you. Have a nice day. Thank you, all. Ciao. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.